welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show. I'm your host Paul, aka Steven Spoilsberg, and this video we're breaking down Back to the Future. The movie kick-started one of the best trilogies of all time, and today we're going to be going through it scene by scene. Selected by the Film Registry for Film Preservation, this is easily one of the best movies ever made and I can't wait to talk about it. Pretty much everyone I know who went to film school are in love with this movie and the script's something that's taught in almost every university. This is something where almost every line in it has a payoff at some point and I was blown away when revisiting it with a, a loser YouTuber breakdown at a more critical eye to it. So come with me Morty, <coughs> sorry Morty, <coughs> as we travel to the past and talk about Back to the Future. You son of a bitch, I'm in. Now the film popped up as an idea in Bob Gale's head when he was one day going through his dad's old yearbook. Seeing his pops as a team made him think about his past and what life must have been like when he was in school. Being a dad myself, like I feel like my kids will remember how cool I was or, or they'll either think that or just what a fucking gimp. It's something that we as kids often don't wonder about our parents either, and all the wild things we've done, our parents probably did too. When I was your age, I never chased a boy, or called a boy, or sat in a parked car with a boy. Why are the animals 18 years old? It's not like I've never parked before. What? So that was a fucking lie. Going wild at parties, petty vandalism, not hitting the thumbs up, all those bad things that we've done, they probably also did too. Our parents had a time before we were born too where they probably weren't burdened with glorious purpose. Now this had Gale thinking that if he had a time machine he'd go back and see his dad to see if they'd become friends. Marty and George share somewhat similarities with them both having dreams that they want to achieve. George is obsessed with becoming a writer and Marty just wants to play the guitar on stage. George not achieving his goals has somewhat had an effect on his son but in the end both get their time in the limelight. Yeah, I guess you guys aren't ready for that yet, but your kids are gonna love it. Telling this idea to Robert Zemeckis, the pieces started to fall in place, and when Spielberg was on board, the ball really got rolling. Gale and Zemeckis created a draft in 1980, with them saying they wanted to do something different than what had come before. You see, typically time travel movies, they showed the past as being a fixed point, whereas the pair had the idea that things could be changed. There's actually a number of different things that alter in the film, which we'll talk more about as we go through the movie. Still though, the first draft was, was a far cry from what we got, with the DeLorean being completely absent. That had the time machine being a room with a laser-like device that helped with the time travel. When I hear about it, I, I kind of imagine the TARDIS, and apparently this device then got put inside a fridge. This was then taken out to an atomic bomb test, with that being the basis of how to get home. However, Spielberg, right? Spielberg, he, he apparently worried that kids, right, might start climbing inside their fridges, and this would make some believe they could use one to survive a nuke. Years later, we, we'd see something similar in Indiana Jones, and dear me, just cracked up a bit learning that. Anyway, the time machine was going to be made by a corporation, but Zemeckis felt an individual was going to act better. Thus, they looked at real life figures such as Einstein, who Doc Brown's dog would later be named after. Einstein died during 1955 and his theory of relativity is used for the time machine test. Einstein theorised that motion caused time to move differently, which meant, meant that a clock moving would tick slightly faster than one that's just stationary. I think. For God's sakes, Jim, I'm a YouTuber, not a physicist. After a number of revisions, the DeLorean got brought in, as its design had an almost otherworldly feel. This also had inspiration from other time machines, with the interface being based on the time machine film from the 1960s. This had the panels on the machine being green, red and yellow, with those colours also coming across to the panel in the car. The car was then going to be driven into the atomic bomb test, but this was eventually removed purely because of the budget. I bet you can catch a couple of nods to it, as the van the DeLoreans first rolled out of has a bumper sticker on it. This says, one nuclear bomb can ruin your whole day. Also, a disclaimer, I keep saying nuclear wrong in every single video. Um, I did used to do an impression of a Russian guy go, I must have nuclear weapons, and since then it's stuck and I'm just keep ruining my videos even more and more. Do not watch my Oppenheimer breakdown. I find your proposal <laughs> acceptable. At the end, when Marty speeds back to the future, we can also see the cinemas playing the Atomic Kid. According to the wiki, there were several other ideas that didn't make the cut, with Marty's actions drastically changing the 80s. Instead of coming home to where he pretty much left things, the entire planet would have hoverboards and flying cars. We all know from our own history we wouldn't get those until 2015, but, but his moves changed it to that. 
Now George was also going to be a famous boxer, which led out from him knocking out Biff after saving Lorraine. However, remnants of this plotline still remain in the film, with Marty carrying a punching bag into George's back garden. This then led into a deleted scene, and it would have Marty giving him boxing lessons and finally figuring out he was a lefty. Throughout the film, he writes with his right hand, but in the end, he punches with his left. The Better Health website did a big report about how kids used to be encouraged to write with their right because left-handedness was seen as being awkward. Most things were built with right-handers in mind, and there was a big push against this being adopted in the 50s. So George striking Biff with his left was finally him shrugging off the life he'd been bullied into and standing up for who he was in more ways than one. <laughs> now Universal head Sid Sheinberg didn't like the title due to the word future being in it. He said they should change it to Spaceman from Pluto because reasons, I guess. Man wanted this. My name is Darth Vader. I am an extraterrestrial from the planet Vulcan. Change to... I am Spaceman from Pluto. But Spielberg did something that shut that idea down. He sent him a note saying, Ah, oh, mate, what a, what, a, what a great joke that was, eh? What a fucking great joke you did there, mate. Or, almost thought you were being serious, you fucking c Which Scheinberg was way too embarrassed to fight back on. He's made you look a right knob. Now, production for the film was hit with a couple of snags, and I'm sure you all know this story about Eric Stoltz. This even got referenced recently in The Flash when they were talking about who starred in Back to the Future. I know, I've seen all of them, and Eric Stoltz is not Marty McFly. Then explain Marty McFly here. Now, what happened is that he was playing Marty, and Melora Hardin was playing Jennifer. So we could have had an alternate timeline with Jan from The Office, but in the end, she got let go too. Fox had actually always been the first choice for Marty, but he couldn't make it due to his contract with Family Ties. You see, Meredith Baxter was pregnant at the time, and this Fox needed to appear in the show more than usual. Stoltz was cast, but things weren't working, and on set he's said to have been very difficult to work with. Man apparently refused to answer to anything other than Marty, and this was so bad that when he was told he'd been fired, Christopher Lloyd said, Who's Eric? I thought he was called Marty. IMDb Trivia also says that Tom Wilson, who plays Biff, almost got his collarbone broken during the lunchroom scenes. Tom asked him to tone it down, but Stoltz just kept going and he caused lots of difficulties. Everyone knew that he wasn't right for the role, and after six weeks of shooting, Baxter had returned to family ties. Stoltz was then called into a room and killed, sorry, sorry, he was called in, and told he wasn't right, and apparently Stoltz also agreed too. Horton was then let go because she was too tall to play against Fox, and the producers had realised that size matters. That's what she said! <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Thus, they managed to work something out with Fox, but it still sounds like it was a really gruelling shoot. Fox would film Family Ties in the day, and then drive over to the set and work from 6 till 6. All the scenes shot in the daytime, they were done on the weekends, with everything working out alright in the end. Also, IMDb Trivia, yeah, says that Stoltz went on to play the Fly in The Fly 2, who was called Martin, so he went from playing Marty McFly to Martin the Fly. Ha <laughs> nice, ha! Nice when they, they include a joke you can steal, and there's still a shot of Stoltz left in the film, but this own change in the timeline drastically changed the outcome. Anyway, that's the making of Trivia, which takes us into the movie itself. Now let us go back to the future! That's the power of love. Now a famous phrase in film is show, don't tell. Boiled down to its basics, it means that film's a visual medium and it's often better to convey something with images rather than a character telling us what's happening. Now why I'm telling you this and not showing you is to talk about the opening shot which conveys so much information to one of the best openings to a film ever. The Doc Browns we begin looking at several clocks which are all set to 7.53. Later on, we learn that this was part of an experiment. Perfect! My experiment worked! They're all exactly 25 minutes slow! And one of the only clocks that's correct is the one on the floor, which is currently set to 8.18. This subtly gives the idea that Doc's been messing with time, and we also have two different time periods here. Now, as we move through the room, we see some decorative clocks, including one with a drunk man slumped up against it. This kind of reminds me of the homeless guy that Marty sees at the end when he finally returns back to the future. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! This guy is actually the character ex Mayor Red Thomas, whose election trucks we see moving through the 50s. In the 80s, the Mayor's Goldie Wilson, whose truck we also see moving through too, bring these moments full circle. 
Shout out to Eric for his video on the deep dive for pointing out that the way the bum swigs the bottle here is also similar to what Lorraine does in the car later on with Marty. We also get a nod to Harold Lloyd's safety first when we see a small figure hanging from a clock. This is of course foreshadowing the moment in the climax where Christopher Lloyd hangs off the clock tower. Doing this ends up breaking the ledge which is another cool detail that appears in the film. When Jennifer and Marty sit in front of it at the 10 minute 30 mark we can see the ledge behind them is absolutely fine. However in 1955 the dark ends up breaking it which is something that then goes on to affect the future. Cut to the hour 41 mark and we get a helicopter flying by and can see that the ledge has now been broken off. Now from this clock we then go past one that has the word regulator on it before then going down to some newspaper clippings. This says that the Brown Mansion was destroyed and that the estate was sold to developers. Bob Gale spoke about this on the commentary and said this was all sold off to fund his time travel research. Also huge shout outs to Mudron on Reddit who pointed out why the Doc's mansion might have burned down. Later on after Doc uses his fire extinguisher we can see that this leaves it almost completely empty. So man probably had an experiment that went haywire but he'd overuse the extinguisher and couldn't put it out. Safety first. Let me show you something. <laughs> now next we move down to photos of Edison and Benjamin Franklin, the two of which, well one of which was a famous inventor. Franklin carried out an experiment with a kite in the wind which was struck by lightning like what happens at the end. Now later on Doc can be seen talking to a picture which he refers to as being Thomas. This is actually Thomas Edison calling back to the photo that we see here. Now next to them is also a picture of Einstein who as we mentioned played a part in Doc's inspiration. On top of this was also Leopold Stawowski who was also used as a way to style his look. Underneath this is the JVC camera that later gets used to film the first time travel attempt. Next to this is also a Burger King cup with wrappers just littering the room. Now when Marty ends up leaving Doc's lab we can see his garage backs onto a Burger King restaurant explaining why there's so many wrappers in the house. The TV is then turned on by one of the clocks but this one has to have had the right time. This is like this purely to show us the report and this is where we learn of the plutonium theft. Doc's been out and about and hasn't been home hence why we then see the dog food piling up in an already full bowl. At this point we watch as Marty enters and he rolls his skateboard over to the plutonium box. So all those shots say tell us so much info that it's hard to argue how good this scene is. Now from this point we cut to an amp interface which we can see labelled CRM114. This is actually an artist Stanley Kubrick who's used the number in a lot of his films including Doctor Strangelove where it was on the radio system. Blowing up the amp, my man's here to make an entrance and it's at this point the film really gets going. Now as Marty skates outside we see as he hitches a ride and then travels through the town centre of Hill Valley. This shot is later repeated in 1955 which just goes to show how times change over the decades. If you've ever moved away from somewhere and then gone back you'll have no doubt seen how even a couple of decades alter things. I love this place being a central location as it perfectly demonstrates the differences between the 50s and 80s. Now as he goes down the main street we can see those two signs with Goldie Wilson's name on them hinting at the character we're going to meet later on. There's also lots of adult entertainment spots and theatres and a better than what it was like when, when Red Thomas was running it mate. Also I wonder if red and Goldie being colours shows that the mares have a theme to them and maybe the guy with the adult theatres is called Blue Ray eh? Because he sells adult movies Blue Ray eh? Fuck's sake. Now the name Hill Valley that was chosen because it's an oxymoron that means it just sounds like your bog standard town where they cared so little about naming it they chose two things that don't even make sense. Down the line I'll talk about how these shots are repeated through the rest of the trilogy and yes you're right I will be covering all the films. <laughs> if that's something you're interested in then please smash the subscribe button and I'll see you back in the future when I release them soon. Now driving the truck we see a man turn around who's rocking what's totally not some Mountain Dew product placement. This is actually stunt coordinator Walter Scott who put this scene together because the man's all about safety first. Now from here Marty skates up to the school where we can catch some graffiti on the wall. Next to a tree you can see Lorraine Dal Calvin which foreshadows the fake name Marty uses with his mum Lorraine. I was wondering if this graffiti was from 1955 but that means the school wouldn't have been clean since then. Instead I, I just think it's a little in joke for when the set decorators were putting this less than pristine look together. After bumping into Principal Strickland he says Now let me give you Nichols with a free advice young man. The so-called Dr. Brown is dangerous, he's a real nutcase. Now you might be wondering why a high schooler's hanging around with an old man. Would you have a seat right in that store please? Sure. 
Look, let, let me explain, Chris. You see, you see, Bob Gale was speaking to the site mental floss, uh, and he talked about how the pair met. He said, For years, Marty was told that Doc Brown was dangerous, a crackpot, a lunatic. Marty snuck into Doc's lab and was fascinated by all the cool stuff that was there. When Doc found him there, he was delighted to find that Marty thought he was cool and accepted him for what he was. You see, Marty stayed with him because he got to use his guitar, and it's all just one big misunderstanding. The, the, poli the police are wait waiting for me outside, aren't they? Fuck! And the principal rattles off how he's just like his dad, and how no McFly ever amounted to anything. Yeah, well, history is gonna change. It's a nice little line of dialogue that then leads us into Marty's audition. Here they play The Power of Love by Huey Lewis in the news, with Huey himself playing the teacher, carrying out the audition. Huey initially just wrote this song, but the creative team weren't exactly thrilled with it since it didn't really tie in with the movie. They said they needed one more that was in line with the plot, and after showing him the film, the band made Back in Time, which is another banger. Now on stage, we see Marty playing alongside a guy who looks a bit like Donny Tourette, but this is actually Michael J. Fox's guitar instructor. Behind the scenes shots of this have been shown on the Blu-rays, making a nice little cameo for the guy who helped him learn it. At the clock tower, Marty talks about how he's too scared to send his audition tape in, but Jennifer then drops this line. It's like Doc Yeah, I know, I know. If you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. Which is something that appears throughout the film, with a person who relays the message getting the credit for it at different points. You know, if you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. Like I've always told you, you put your mind to it, you can accomplish anything. It's lots of timey-wimey, wibbly-wobbly stuff, with Doc Brown telling Marty, who then told his father, and then told him, bringing things full circle. Also, I love how Marty just checked out the girls that walked past him, and it's literally that mean with a man getting distracted. Get out of here, kid. You got no future. I mean, I just don't think I can take that kind of rejection. But this line about him having no future adds some subtext to the plot, as we're meant to worry that Marty might not get back. What, right here, right now in the cafeteria? What if she said no? I don't know if I could take that kind of a rejection. Around the area, you might have also noticed that there's businesses closing down, and it seems like it's a dying city centre. On the bench, we can catch a sign for Zales Jewelers, which says that it's now in the Twin Pine Mall. This shows that the businesses are moving up there, and it sets up one of the main locations that appears in the story. Now, on top of this, we can also catch two women petitioning to save the clock tower. This headline documents how it was struck by lightning, with one of the women telling him it got struck in 1955 and stopped at that exact moment. This gives Marty all he needs to know, so he can use his info to power up the time machine. However, Marty's distracted by a 4x4, which is what he later ends up getting bought by his parents. Someday, Jennifer. Someday. Marty's dream of taking Jennifer up to the lake in that truck is something that he gets to do at the end, but here it seems like it's just a pipe dream. Just above the women, we can also see a sign that says Ask Mr. Foster, travel since 1888. This shop's clearly been around for a long time, and we can also catch it at the hour 41 mark in 1955. Though you can't see it here, we have other shots of the sign for this that says time to travel, which is a, it's a little time travel joke that. At this point, Jennifer writes down her number, which begins with 5555, indicating that it's completely fictional. Stop, stop ringing it. Huge shout outs to Webborn on Reddit for pointing out that Doc Brown's number is Klondike 54385, with K and L both being on the five digit, meaning the number is actually 5552. Also, as Marty puts it away, you can see you can see the theatre behind him showing orgy American style. Make make sure you subscribe to the channel to watch us break down that as well. Shabow! Now at this point, Marty hitches his way back home to lie in the States, where we see the outside of his house. Later on, we get a better shot of this, where Biff hasn't smashed George's car like it's a like button. Now, a cool detail back in 1955 is that Marty comes across a billboard of what these homes will look like. Placing it next to the shot we see at the end, it actually lines up really nicely with the way the real house looks. George's car being wrecked is also juxtaposed nicely at the end, as here Biff crashes it, whereas there he's cleaning it. Hey, and look. Uh, now Biff, I want to make sure that we get two coats of wax this time, not just one. Don't con me. You look closely at where Biff's waxing yet, you can see he hasn't even finished the first coat up yet, and he's just putting it on now. You, you don't, don't try to con me, Biff. Now inside the house, George is a lot more like his 1950s version, with him having the slick back of hair and pocket protector. This shows he never really grew out of that state, and is sort of just trapped there being a weak man. Also here we can see that George is wearing glasses, whereas in the alternate 85 he doesn't have them anymore. According to IMDb Trivia, this is because he could afford to get contact lenses, so instead he just wears them. 
Eric also pointed out that we can see he's got grey hair, whereas in the earlier versions the slick back look makes it seem darker. This is given by the grease in the product, which in itself was a big thing in the 50s. Now Biff blames him for not saying the car had a blind spot and that he spilt beer all over himself, which means McFly's gotta pay his cleaning bill. He also has some really good lines here that pay off much later when we get to the diner. Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Oh, it doesn't do till Monday. Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Uh, think, McFly. Think. Hey, think, McFly. Think. I gotta have time yeah. to get them retyped. Yeah. Uh, do you realize what would happen if I handed my reports in your handwriting? I gotta have time to recopy it. You realize what would happen if I hand in my homework in your handwriting? I'll get fired. I'll get kicked out of school. You wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Uh, you wouldn't want that to happen, would you? Would you? Oh, of course not, Biff. Would you? Well, now of course not, no, Biff. I wouldn't no. want that to happen. Now look, I'll uh. Fin what are you looking at, butthead? those reports on up tonight and I'll run them on over first thing tomorrow, all right? Okay, Biff, well, I'll, uh, I'll finish that on up tonight and then I'll, uh, bring it over first thing tomorrow morning. Hey, not too early, I sleep in Saturday. Oh, McFly, your shoes untied. Hey, not too early, I sleep in Sundays. Oh, mm -hmm. McFly, your shoes untied. Oh, oh. Don't be so gullible, McFly. <laughs> don't be so gullible, McFly. Okay. I don't want to see you in here okay. again. <laughs> George stands and admits that he's not good at confrontation, and during this, we see his fist clenching up. This is almost like he's trying to throw a punch and thinking back to what he should have done when he was a teen. Now, the car being totaled means Marty can't take the trip, and George's weaknesses are affecting his life too. From here, we cut to George eating a box of peanut brittle, which looks worse than s some of the videos we put out. Now, there was actually a deleted scene in the film where he bought a case that he didn't want from a neighbour. This was to show that he would just do what he was told, but it was already spelled out in the prior scene, so they ended up cutting it. At this point, they start watching a show, which is something that also pops up during the 50s. Lorraine ends up slamming down a cake, which is supposed to celebrate her brother getting out of jail. Unfortunately, man didn't end up making it out, and we meet this character back in the past. You're my Uncle Joey. Gotta get used to these bars, kid. <laughs> Obviously, the bars, oh well, well you get that, but I love how he's wearing black and white as well, just like a prison uniform. Now, Marty's family are kind of down on their luck, with his brother working in a fast food restaurant and also taking the bus. At the end, this is the complete opposite, with George's change affecting the whole bunch. Lorraine then recounts how she and George met, with both the ball and thunderstorm also getting mentioned. No, it was then that I realized that I was going to spend the rest of my life with him. <laughs> take notice of the life box there too, with a game playing off the line that we've just heard. Cut to Marty's room, and next to the clock we can also see Pepsi Free. This was a version of the drink that didn't have any caffeine in it, and it's what Marty later tries to order at the diner. Right, give me a Pepsi Free. You want a Pepsi, pal? You're gonna pay for it. As the camera pulls out as well, we can see a big version of the photo that Marty later has of his siblings. Now at this point, he travels to the Twin Pine Mall, which leads us into watch the most famous Easter egg of all time. Doc says, Oh man, Peabody, on all of this. And when Marty travels back to the 50s, he knocks over one of the pine trees. This is later revealed to be at the Peabody farm, which we can see by the mailbox outside. When Marty returns here at the end, we can see the malls now called Lone Pine Mall, and this is due to Marty knocking over one of the trees in the past. Peabody's son is also called Sherman, which I found out from the making of notes, this is a nod to a big show. 1959's Peabody's Improbable History, that involved Sherman and his dog Mr. Peabody. They travel through time to get to certain points in history, and according to the trivia on the 2014 film, the characters also travel back at 88 miles per hour. Haven't seen it, but that's a pretty cool nod, and Bob Gale also talked about how on October 26, 85, how people showed up to the mall expecting Marty to arrive. He didn't, and sometimes patience doesn't pay off. Now, Dirk also explains that DeLorean needs 1.21 gigawatts of power before Einstein arrives at 121. According to IMDb, gigawatts was mispronounced from gigawatts, and this was due to a science official the creative team hired basically just saying it that way. Einstein getting sent through times, also similar how dogs were used on space missions in early orbits to test whether flights were safe for humans. After sending him, Einstein's then return, and this leaves the car completely covered in ice. I feel like this might be down to it going against entropy, which creates a frosted effect all around the car. Something similar was seen in Tenet when an explosion was reversed which then created ice. 
Doc also reveals what happened the day he thought of time travel. I was standing on the edge of my toilet hanging a clock. I slipped, hit my head on the edge of the sink. And when I came to, I had a revelation. And this kind of reminds me of what happened with Isaac Newton when he discovered gravity. Later on, when Marty arrives at his house, we can also see he's got a big bandage on his head from it. Now from here we get the first of many things that were referenced in Avengers Endgame. As I'm sure you know, there is a bit about how Back to the Future 2 is a bunch of bullshit, but here we also see the plutonium's red fluid. This is what the pin particles were designed on, and it's not the only thing here that would pay off down the line. Doc talks about how he wants to travel into the future and see who ends up winning the World Series. Back to the Future 2 of course involves the future and it also has a big plot centred around sports games. Either way, Doc Brown starts to rattle off his plans for the video and we can see he's got a red notepad in his pocket. This is actually a one for Gremlins, which Steven Spielberg also helped produce. Now at this point the terrorist shows up, which leads Brown to say he doesn't know how they found him. Oh my god. They found me. I don't know how, but they found me. But it's probably because you got your name printed on this side of the van, mate. Anyway, it leads to him dying and Marty driving off. Hitting 88 miles per hour, we watch as he's taken back to the past to play some shitty games that suck ass. Sorry, couldn't help myself. Now, after crashing into the farm, Peabody thinks it might be an alien and the DeLorean was actually chosen because it looked a bit like a spacecraft. Shoutouts to you says the little man on reddit for pointing out that the DeLorean's designer also gets a little nod in the credits. There we can see he's credited as being a time travel consultant which is a nice little joke if you, if you stick around and watch them. Now the speedometer was also changed too with it getting a top speed of 95 instead of the original 85. This means that they can show it goes up to 88 rather than just hitting 85 and then not going past it. Marty then ends up travelling to Lion Estate before he wanders into town. Here we see a poster at the cinema with Ronald Reagan's name on it which later gets referenced when talking about the president. Who's president of the United States in 1985? Ronald Reagan. The scene was actually shot to resemble a Twilight Zone episode Where Is Everybody which has a man wandering into a town square looking confused. Both were shot on the same back lot at Universal, with the creative team deliberately giving a nod to it. Now here we catch several things we saw in 1985 including the Texaco garage and the clock tower which now works. Along with this we also have the sign for Hill Valley which popped up at the 6 minute and 37 mark in 1985. Here the slogan is, a nice place to live, whereas in the past or, or, or the future, I'm guessing it's not because that's been taken away. Now the diner, Marty meets his dad and Biff, along with Billy Zane who plays the character Match. Man doesn't get any lines in the film, but he carries around a matchstick in his mouth, which makes him look cool, so I'm, I might start doing it too. We also meet Goldie, who's inspired to be mayor, but since it happened anyway, he would have done this without Marty. Now at this point, Marty realises his dad was a peeping Tom, which uh, is a bit weird, but either way, he ends up getting hit by his granddad's car, which means that he swaps places with George. He says... Stella! Another one of these damn kids jumped in front of my car! Which makes me think that he might have hit George before. Woken up by his mother, he thinks it's all just been a bad dream, but it's your worst nightmare, mate, because your mum's trying to fuck you. That's right, baby! It's an incest story! Ow! And she calls him Calvin Klein because that's what was stitched into his underwear, which was the fashion at the time. In the translated versions, they changed this to Levi Strauss in Spain, with it being Pierre Cordin in France because Klein wasn't known outside of the US. Now Lorraine, she's a bit full on, so you can see how she would have wooed a pushover like George. Girls taking cheeky little looks, and you can even catch her in the mirror peeping at Marty as he goes to put his pants on. Around the table, they roll in the television with this dinner echoing the one that the family had before. This is showing the same episode of The Honeymooners, which also aired during 1955. After being freaked out by his mum pitching his leg, he ends up leaving and we then get this line. You ever have a kid who acts that way, I'll disown you. Now after he heads out to Doc Brown's manor, we see the garage before then panning up to the bigger house. Inside, man's got a different dog, with this one being named after Copernicus. Doc's also rocking a mind-reading device, but there's actually the possibility that this might work. Come here from a great distance. You want me to buy a subscription to the Saturday Evening Post? You want me to make a donation to the Coast Guard Youth Auxiliary? For distances, Moddy's travel from the future, and this Saturday Evening Post what Moddy used to read the date on. As for the Coast Guard, man's rocking a life preserver, and he explained he was a sailor to not get any suspicion. So maybe it does work, but either way, he doesn't buy Marty's from the future. Class of 1984, 
pretty mediocre photographic fakery. They cut off your brother's hair. As we know, the photo starts to fade as time changes, with his brother slowly disappearing as the past starts to alter. Also, if you zoom in on the photo, you can see his brother's hair is indeed starting to fade, which is a really cool detail. Now Doc then talks about Ronald Reagan and asks if Jane Wyman's the first lady. However, by 1955, Reagan was married to Nancy, so the timing of this, it is a bit off. Reagan, however, really loved this line, and when he was watching it, he asked them to replay the scene. Ronald was such a big fan of the movie, he even quoted it during his State of Union address. Never has there been a more exciting time to be alive. A time of rousing wonder and heroic achievement. As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where are we going? We don't need roads. After revealing he knows about the flux capacitor, we see his doc starts to believe him, and they drive to where the DeLorean's hidden out. I love the eeriness of this entire scene, and it then leads into them replaying the tape of the time machine. Doc then asks what he's wearing. Well, this, this is a radiation suit. Of course, because of all the fallout from the atomic wars. This of course comes in the wake of the invention of the atomic bomb, and there was worry that it would lead to more and more wars. When first exiting the car, Marty asks if Doc's got a Devao suit, who were a band in the 80s and known for wearing them on stage. Brown then says, No wonder your president has to be an actor, he's gotta look good on television. This was actually a little joke about JFK, who in the debates was said to look so good that it helped him get elected. Realising he can't generate the power to send him back due to the lack of plutonium, the pair then realise they can use lightning to send him back to the future. And although they want Marty to lie low, they realise he can't because he's slowly being erased. Travelling to the high school, we see it before the 80s hit, and it ended up getting covered in graffiti. Huge shout out to Tokyo No and Reddit for pointing out that when they first see George, we can also see a poster with Ron Woodward on it. This is a nod to Ronald T. Woodward, who worked as a key grip on this and the other movies. Now that the school's pretty much the same, there's one key difference we see in the ball later on. The gym is different to the one Marty auditioned in, but there is a little poster that points this out. Earlier in the movie, when we first met Strickland, you can see a poster up behind him talking about the new gym. There's also a guy who puts a kick me sign on George's back, who later tries to cut in and take Lorraine from him. Still though, he stands up to him too, bringing things full circle from here when he also got bullied by him. Marty then tries to introduce Lorraine to him, and Doc is like... Fucking hell mate, y your mum thinks you're the most handsomest boy in the world, and not in the same way that my mum thinks I'm the most handsomest boy in the world. Realising that the enchantment under the sea dance will be a good place to hook them up, the rest of the movie then all builds towards that. Marty goes to George in the cafeteria, and lo look at this guy over George's back, keeps bloody, keeps bloody looking at the camera, and that's why you're not a famous actor now. Either way, George refuses to share his stories with Marty because he worries that if he showed them to people, then people wouldn't like them. This is of course similar to Marty, who's also in the same predicament, in that he refuses to send his tape to the record label. There was actually a scene in which Marty would put his tape in an envelope, but in the end he'd just leave this on the dresser. This was deleted, but you can actually see this envelope at one point in the film. At the hour 47 mark, we see Marty leaving his room, and in his hand he's carrying the envelope. This was meant to show that Marty had had a change of heart, and in the end he was gonna send it off. Now Marty ends up stepping in to stop Biff harassing his mother. So why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? And this line was actually improvised by Wilson, who got really into the character by channeling his own life. Everyone describes Tom as being a nice guy in real life, with him being a far cry from how he acts with Biff. However, Wilson was actually bullied badly in school, and he said he channeled this into Biff to make him the big butthead he is. Now Biff Tannen was given that surname after Ned Hannon, who at one point was the head of Universal. On the next scene, we get this line from George. But I can't go to the dance. I'll miss my favourite television programme, Science Fiction Theater. And this is actually a little meta joke, because the show had an actor called Michael Fox in it. I don't know if you know, mate, but when registering with SAG, you have to submit a unique name in order to not cause confusion with credits. This Michael added in the J, with this being a little nod to the actor in that. Science Fiction Theater. That night, Marty ends up going to his dad in the suit, which is when he puts on music to wake him up. This has the name Edward Van Halen on it, and this is because the band Van Halen refused to lend their name in the movie. Eddie didn't mind though, and he gave permission to use his name, and apparently the licks we hear are performed by him. Now you might also catch there's a hairdryer on his belt, which he uses like a gun during a deleted scene. According to IMDb Trivia, this was something Doc left in the car, but it was never addressed, so they just cut that bit out. They were also going to have Marty knock George out with chloroform, which explained why he slept in so much that he missed school the next day. Now that has George going to the diner, where he orders a milk and make it chocolate. 
Throughout the film, we learn this is called Lou's Diner, and in 1985, Lou still keeps ownership. Over there, it's called Lou's Aerobic Center, showing how he ended up changing the business. I guess what, mate? I've had, I've had a cold again, so I've been recording chunks of this video at different points. Forgot to point out that when Marty goes to pay for the coffee, we can also see he puts a guitar pick on the counter, showing he carries one at all times. That's back in the video though, because of the magic of editing, and outside the diner, we can also see a sign with some records on it. This is advertising the ballad of Davy Crockett, who gets several nods throughout the film. Upon entering the diner, the song can be heard in the background, and Lorraine's brother also wears a raccoon skin hat. This is building off the back of the Davy Crockett craze, which was a big thing throughout the whole 50s. Now from here we see George swaggering about as he asks Lorraine out. A lot of his mannerisms were based on the Nutty Professor, not that one, the one with Jerry Lewis that was released in the 60s. They gave it a direct nod to that with the white jacket and the way George dances by himself being in line with it. Guy's so nervous, he says density instead of destiny, but the wooing's broken up once more by Biff. Marty ends up saving the day, inventing skateboards, and making his mum fancy him even more. Several of the moments here would later be riffed on in other movies, with them doing a lot of it beat for beat down the line. I'll talk about that more when we cover those films though, but it always ends with Biff getting smashed like it's a like button. Now back at Docs, we see he's trying to watch the end of the tape, but he refuses to hear about what happens next. However, as we know, he'll eventually play it, which leans in with his acceptance that it's okay to change things and just say what the hell. Now, we see he's mapped out a model of Hill Valley, which would later be referenced in Loki when Obi does the same thing. For the clock tower, we can see that he's using one of his own wristwatches, which has a time set to 10.04. That's because that is the time that the lightning strikes, and it shows that the man's got some nice attention to detail. Now you might also notice that just before he points to the clock tower head that we can see he's got a wristwatch on both arms. This was done to show how obsessed with time that he was and I think it's a really cool detail that just helps to add into the character. With a little wind up car that pops up in the franchise down the line we see as this ends up crashing into the theatre down the road. This is something that Marty does at the end in real life because obviously he didn't have the room to hit 88 and then hit the brakes. Lorraine then arrives and asks him to the dance with Doc pulling a fuck's sake's face throughout. Now one of the major questions people have about the movie is how don't Marty's parents remember who he is? Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? Bob Gale eventually explained it to the Hollywood Reporter and asked them if they remembered a kid that they met for eight days at 17. Do you remember someone you met on holiday for a week? And chances are that, that you'd probably struggle. Gale then said that they'd have a bit of a hazy memory and 25 years later without a photo, it wouldn't really connect. Now cutting across to the clock tower, we then get this line. Are you sure about this storm? Since when can weathermen predict the weather, let alone the future? This actually plays off in part two when we have the weather running on cycles, meaning that the weatherman is finally able to predict it. Other aspects that pay off down the line are set up here too, with Marty writing a letter to Doc. This is then put together by Doc, and part two ends with Doc sending Marty a letter, coming directly from the past. Everything's kept under wraps literally, and we even catch Doc Brown bribing a police officer to keep things hush hush. Anyway, jam to the enchantment under the sea dance, and we see Marty nervously waiting outside for George to show up. However, I don't even think man had to intervene, because Lorraine realises it's wrong when she kisses her son, which is a bit gross, mate, but you dodged a bullet. Aaliyah Thompson, she said that she kept this dress, and one day her daughter Zoe wore it on Halloween. Zoe's often been said to look a lot like her mum, and this Lorraine cosplay probably went down a storm. According to the behind the scenes trivia, they also played a little prank on Michael J. Fox at this point, as they had him doing a spit take, but they swapped it out for real alcohol. Man ended up drinking it anyway, and then doing the spit take, but the scene can be seen on the outtakes where he, he looks a bit shocked. Now George saves the day and Marty's enlisted in the band, with him still having to play the song so his parents get together. Marvin, Marvin, you gotta play. See, that's where they kiss for the first time on the dance floor. They can't kiss, they can't fall in love, and I'm history. Really love how they use the term I'm history there, and as we see the band's called Marvin Berry and the Starlighters. As we learn, his cousin's Chuck Berry, aka the father of rock and roll, and Marvin makes a call to him after Marty plays Johnny B. Good. Marty even gets a song credit in the credits, which we're not sure about the optics on that mate, but we can also see the drummer playing a swing style since rock and roll drumming hadn't been popularised yet. Originally this was gonna lead to the dance turning to a riot, which would then have police showing up. IMDB trivia states Marty would also tell Doc the secret ingredient in Coca-Cola, which would then cause history a change. Upon arriving back to the future, everything would run on Coca-Cola, and we discovered Doc had invented pretty much everything and had used the drink to make money. 
Marty also plays a Gibson ES345, which wasn't actually brought out until 1955, but the movie's so good that I'm gonna let it slide, mate. I'm gonna let it slide this one time. Now, though the school doesn't necessarily jive with the guitar shredding, George has become popular now, with students even telling him he should run for class president. The whole school love him, and Marty tells Lorraine his true name, which he says is nice, but not nice enough to name your firstborn after him, eh? Now, when they're in the street, Doc runs to the back of the shot, while Marty stays in the foreground. This composition is used throughout the film at several points, with Doc and George being the ones to do it. Symbolically, this could show that Doc's almost like a father to Marty, with these moments all mirroring each other. Now, Doc says Marty has... Exactly 7 minutes and 22 seconds! Which is a really cool detail because from that point when Marty travels back, it's exactly 7 minutes and 22 seconds. Climbing up the clock tower, he's then scared by one of the statues, which were originally made for the 1982 film Cat People. Here we also see lightning in the clouds above them, which had to be done with models, and this was due to CGI not being advanced enough to pull it off. Lighting fiber wire, they were able to capture the effect, and they also used to make bride to create the wind during these moments. Anyway, Marty ends up driving to the spot, while Doc desperately tries to reconnect the wires. The DeLorean at this point doesn't start, and Marty flicks the headlights on and off to give the Morse code for SOS. Now there are a few times, few times I'll be back in time. Now, the DeLorean had its own sentience, and it refused to start up at this moment. It said that it's like the TARDIS, in which it was saving it until the right moment, and if that's what you want to believe, mate, good for you, and that's the wee time I'll be back in time. The Doc sliding down from the clock tower is the only scene that appears in all three films. This was performed by stuntman Bob Yerkes, who also got paid for them without doing any extra work. Anyway, Marty arrives back in the 80s, moments before Doc Brown was killed. Watching the terrorists arrive, Marty's unable to start the car, and thus he runs after them all, but he shows up too late. Doc's gunned down, and I love the way Marty goes to open his mouth to say no, but his past self says it for him. It's revealed that Doc ended up wearing a vest, and in the end, it's all fine and dandy, mate. Returning home, we see as Doc goes into the future, with him then travelling out to the year 2015. Waking up in a similar position to how he was earlier in the movie, we hear back in time over the radio, and we see him coming across his new life. Man's having croissants for breakfast, his, he works in an office, and his mum and dad are looking completely banging. Lorraine's lost weight, and it apparently took three hours in the makeup chair to make the couple look elderly. George ends up getting the first copy of his book as well, and this is titled A Match Made in Space. On the cover, we can see Moddy's yellow hazmat suit, and he's bringing a man and woman together who are sitting in their bedclothes. You get that one, mate. You know what that means. And we see outside as Jennifer arrives. For the sequel, they had to reshoot the whole bit because Jennifer ended up being played by Elizabeth Shue. Sadly, Claudia Wells' mother was diagnosed with cancer, and thus she went to care for her instead of taking on the role. Originally, we were going to have George flicking through yearbook from the 50s, and at this point he'd see Marty in the crowd. Man then said, Nah, it couldn't be, but it is, which was going to be the line that then ended the film. However, they wanted to tease something else, and thus they went in this direction. On top of the car, we can also see a Mr. Fusion, which was also used years before in the movie Alien. A Doc Brown powers up the car by taking things out of the trash, and we can see a can of Miller High Life. Huge shoutouts to Everless Cool on Reddit for pointing out that this was known as the champagne of beers. They noticed that earlier in the film when Biff grabs a can from the fridge that this is just a can of your bog standard Miller Lite. This George, he's now living the high life and drinking a delicious can of Miller High Life, sponsors of the channel. Ciao! Now when this scene was shown to audiences, it was displayed in black and white because ILM hadn't finished the effects. Still though, the audience kept cheering, and it made the execs realise they had a major hit on their hands. Thus they moved the release date forward, and this only gave the production team 9 weeks to finish. It was a rush, but they got through it, and managed to get it out back in time. Ow! Now, the movie's obviously had an insane legacy, and I'm sure you're well aware of how big it was. Both Zemeckis and Gale have retained the rights, and both have stated they'll not authorise any sequels or remakes as long as they're alive, which... Don't challenge Hollywood with that, mate. You know, you know they've got the snipers. Either way, this movie held a record for staying at number one for three months, making it one of the most successful films of all time. It would of course go on to spawn two successful sequels, and I think it's one of the best trilogies ever. Love the posters as well, mate. And and I feel like trilogies should have poster themes just like this, because look how good it looks. I bloody love it. 
And I hope you've loved it too. And we will be back with Back to the Future Part 2. Spending three months at the top of the box office, a sequel was put into production faster than 88 miles per hour, with both Fox and Lloyd signing on instantly. According to IMDb Trivia, Fox saw the To Be Continued, which was added to the VHS of the first one, and immediately rang his agent to make sure he was included. That's now since been removed, but it did tease at the studio's confidence in the franchise. You have to remember, this was a time before studios announced 800 movies in a shared universe before they'd even made the first one, and thus this was a big thing for fans of the film. Meeting back up with screenwriter Bob Gale, Robert Zemeckis hit the ground running, but instantly they were filled with regret. Realising they left Jennifer in the car at the end of the first one, they knew they'd have to come up with a story that involved her too. You can kind of tell that they wanted her out the way as soon as we hit 2015, as she shoved out the way, then gets picked up, goes back to the 80s and then gets shoved out the way again. Neither of the creators had actually ever planned a sequel, and that line about the kids was supposed to just end that movie with a joke. So getting her out of the way became very important to them, and it does kind of slow down the pacing of the film. Now, though the future seemed like the next logical step, Gale took other approaches in the early drafts. The first one was going to take place mainly in the late 60s, with Lorraine as a flower child protesting the war. George was also going to be working at Berkeley, with him being a professor that specialised in literature. The first film ended with his debut book getting published, which had many wondering why it took so long. George had obviously been desperate to be a science fiction writer, so this helped to explain why he only dropped his first one in the 80s. Although Zemeckis was working on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, he started to come up with his own ideas. Zemeckis thought they could just revisit the first film and show the events from another angle. Now in our first video, we talked about the issues with Eric Stoltz, who was originally in the role of Marty. The casting curse carried over to this too, with Crispin Glover refusing to sign on. On the first film, he disagreed about the ending, which painted wealth as leading into happiness. The reason that I didn't end up being in the film, it's, it's more complex than this, but I, I was asking questions the, there, the, that the, produ the producer's director didn't like. Glover took issue with a prize at the end being a truck when he thought that love should be the film's message. He thought that morally this taught the wrong lessons, but reluctantly shot it after being shot down. According to Glover, this led to friction with Zemeckis, and by the time the second film rolled round, this all spilled over. Glover apparently wanted a million for his role, and after this was denied, the role was then recast. In the film, we see Jeffrey Wiseman, who's been done up to look like Glover, with them also employing archival footage to help beef up the role. Glover has denied that the dispute was over pay, and said he only got offered $125,000. What, what happened in the negotiation was, I, I actually w w wanted to be in the film, mm -hmm. uh, but the, uh, the offer was less than half of what Leah Thompson and Tom Wilson, who had similar sized uh, roles, oh, sure, yeah. and it just, it wasn't fair. According to Collider, he's refused to attend any cast meetings, with him solely placing the blame on Bob Gale. Collider have said that Gale doesn't know why it's falling on him, as both Zemeckis and Spielberg were involved with the recast. There are negative things that have been yeah. said to me and then about me on the Blu-rays that are, are, are not true. And, uh, oh, a commentary, really? Uh, yeah, Ow. yeah. He said things that are like, uh, I mean, I, I haven't listened mm. to it all in completion myself, but I've had people come up and say, did this, this, and this? I said, where did you hear that? And they said, on the on the commentary on the Blu-ray for Back to the Future. And, and uh, it's always from him. I, I, hmm. It's not from Robert Zemeckis. It's not. I mean, Sp Steven Spielberg doesn't comment to, at all. <laughs> no. But but <laughs> it, 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 any yeah. anything. Is, uh, Bob Gale still is. That's his main um, career at this point. Sure. Either way, this eventually led to a lawsuit with Glover saying they used his likeness without getting his permission. This entire thing was resolved outside of court, but it's been a major turning point in actors' likeness rights. SAG contracts now make it so you can't use an actor's likeness without at first at least getting their consent. Now whether they agreed with him or not, I think the idea of wealth is something that the film very heavily grapples with. The sports almanac is something Moddy wants to use to make money, but in the end it just causes lots of issues. So though Glover didn't appear in the film, you could argue there was some influence over the things he brought up last time. Now on top of this, Claudia Wells left the film too, which meant they had to reshoot the opening with Elizabeth Shue. More like Elizabeth reshoot. Anyway, Wells was more to do with personal issues, with her actually voluntarily leaving the role. Unfortunately, her mother was ill with cancer, and Wells chose to look after her instead of being in the film. 
Wells ended up providing a voice for the Back to the Future game, though, and in the end, it's all Wells and done. <laughs> oh, look, because of the issues with Glover, they were hit with a snag, but in many ways, it helped to develop the script. Killing George, he could be absent from the alternate timeline and thus not have to appear after his scene early on. This would make Biff seem even more sinister and give Lorraine way more to do. To keep production costs down, they also shot it back to back with part 3 and thus they figured out how to excise George from the plot without causing issues. So off they were to 2015 for part 2, the land of hoverboards and flying cars. Now, so obviously none of this shit happened, but how did they get it all so wrong? You should be ashamed of yourself. Absolutely ashamed. I ain't gonna lie, I'm getting cooked. <laughs> <laughs> well, Blade Runner, right, that actually played a big part with them basing the technology of what was in that. Blade Runner is, of course, set in 2019, so I just dial it back four years, mate, and you get the idea. Zemeckis actually said at the time he was worried about the future because he knew deep down they'd make inaccurate predictions. On the 30th anniversary of the Blu ray releases, though, they actually made a show, and in the end, they explained it all. Titled Doc Brown Saves the World, it features a message explaining what happened. This had the Doc saying that he travelled out to 2040 and discovered something wrong in the tech of the past or the future at the time. Hoverboards and dehydrated food made everyone overweight, and on top of this, the world itself had ended. Why? Well, because the Mr. Fusion, the bloody Mr. Fusion, that had a glitch that caused a nuclear holocaust that destroyed the planet. Thus he ended up going back to 2015 and stopped all this stuff from ever being invented. So in the end, that's why we don't have it now, and I'd actually do quite like that they went and cleared that all up. Anyway, that's all the making of trivia that you need to know. Now let's break down Back to the Future 2, Electric Boogaloo. Now the movie begins on October 26, 1985 with a shot for shot remake of how the original movie ended. We place these scenes together so you can see how they line up and it was obviously due to the whole Jennifer recasting thing. Obviously they're not going to get everything back on because it's so difficult to recapture these moments perfectly. If you're going to jump over to this immediately from that, stuff will stick out like Lorraine's breasts. What? But on the whole they do get it pretty close. However, a couple of cool little details that I noticed here are that the license plate on the Toyota changes in the second film. Originally, it was 2EZP916, whereas here it's 2 back 86 0 I was wondering if the 2 back was a reference to this being the second Back to the Future, but unfortunately I couldn't find anyone in the commentary confirming it. However, I think that's the case. Now, in case you missed our last breakdown, we also see Doc Brown going through the trash and can catch a can of Miller High Life. This was known as the Champagne of Beers, and it was supposed to show George had gone up in the world, as before this, the can Biff grabbed was just your bog standard Miller Lite. We also see the Mr. Fusion on top of the car, which was a prop that also showed up in Alien. Later on, when we get to the future, you can also catch Fusion Industries in the back alley. As the DeLorean reverses out, we can also see it's got a barcode for the license plate, and they also add in a scene of Biff spotting the DeLorean take off. Now for the title sequence, we get a point of view shot for what's likely meant to be the car moving through the clouds. According to the good folks at IMDb, this was originally shot for a film called Firefox. That was starring none other than Clint Eastwood, which was a name mod he uses in part 3 when he travels to the past. Later on when we see Biff in the hot tub, we can also catch him watching a fistful of dollars. This foreshadows what happens in part 3, as Moddy uses the same trick here in the shootout with Beef at Tannen. Amongst the names, you'll also see Billy Zane, who returns once more for the role of Match. For that movie, he wasn't really a known actor, but for this film, he'd established himself a lot. Still though, he decided to return to the movie, and even though he knew it'd be a small role, he did it because this helped to build his name. As the car comes in, they pass by the sign for the courthouse square, with this apparently being a nightmare to assemble. Why? We stop asking that, I'll tell you. Like when, well, back when they filmed the first movie, yeah, they built it as the pristine 1955 version first. They then shot those scenes and messed up the set so that they could then shoot the stuff for the beginning and the end. However, when they went to shoot part two, they had to match it to be the same as the first film, and according to the wiki, it cost them more to rebuild it than what it would have cost to build it all from scratch. The courthouse of course appears throughout the trilogy with it being a landmark that they had to style and rebuild several times over. Now, something else that fits the Blade Runner aesthetic is the rain that's constantly beating down on the car. LA, lovely LA, it's meant to be a paradise where the beer flows like wine and the sun never stops shining. 
Blade Runner had it pouring to show how much humans had affected the planet, whereas yeah, it's controlled by the weatherman. This was meant to poke fun at a line in part one when Doc Brown thought that a storm wasn't coming. Are you sure about this storm? Since where can weathermen predict the weather? As they move towards the square, we can also see a hyperlane Phoenix, Boston and London. This shows just how much travel has advanced with people now being able to drive across the planet. As they turn in we see the Hill Valley sign with Goldie Wilson Jr now being the mayor. Goldie was someone we met in part 1 with his election vans being about in 1985. The tagline is also back to being a nice place to live which was what it was during 1955. In the 80s they didn't have that but this shows how the reputation has been restored. When you think about it there's really three versions of the town with the first one being the Twin Pines Mall one. This is then altered into the more idyllic one at the end before it's then transformed into the, the nightmare timeline because of Biff Tannen. Now that second one's what we're witnessing the branch of here so maybe that's why they included that tagline. Under it they've also changed your typical warning signs which normally say stuff like please drive safely, seatbelts save lives. Here though, nice little joke with them changing it to fly safely and ejection seats save lives. Upon landing Doc says, Man, the post office isn't as efficient as the weather service. Which kind of foreshadows the two things that affect him throughout the film. Doc is sent back in time by the weather and he also uses the postal service to send a letter to Marty. Doc then ends up peeling off his skin which we learn was because of a rejuvenation clinic. This was carried out because of practical reasons and so that Christopher Lloyd wouldn't have to constantly wear old man makeup. We also see Marty getting some self-lacing Nikes which the company made for real during 2015. To afford them though you're gonna need the almanac cause right now a pair will set you back about 13 grand. The ones from the movie sold for 70 G's, I'm gonna have to do a lot of sponsorship deals to pay for that. At this point Marty's given a jacket and told to pull his pockets out because that's what all kids do in the future along with thumbs up in the videos. He's also given a cap and looks almost identical to his son except for he has blue eyes whereas his sons are brown. Dumping Jennifer Doc then shows Marty a newspaper which actually has some really cool little details on it. In the top left we can see the sports section and this starts off with a game called Slam Ball. This was originally going to be in the film but unfortunately they had to cut it due to budgeting reasons. We also see the Cubs sweep the series in 5 which is summing up foreshadows the whole sports almanac thing. Gale put it in as a joke and though he got that wrong he did in the end get something right. Gale correctly predicted Miami would have a baseball team by 2015 which is something that shows up in the film. Lastly on the right hand side we can see Washington prepares for Queen Diana's visit as she was of course expected to stay with Charles and Rule. As we know her life was sadly cut short in 1997 during a car crash while she was out in Paris. As Marty pulls it in we also get a better look at the newsline column with the first line being about the thumb bandits. In the future you're paid by fingerprint and they amputated someone's arm in order to get the money. We can also catch one that says Tokyo stocks up which was put in there due to Japan's strong economy. This confirmation of a madame president with a headline saying she's tired and the USA Today also says it has 3 billion readers hinting at how much the population's grown. Lastly we can see in the top right that it costs $6 which is of course due to inflation. The price of things going up was earlier hinted at by Doc who gives Marty 50 bucks just to buy a Pepsi. Go in and order a Pepsi, here's a 50. Now the reason Junior is jailed is because lawyers have been abolished in the future and thus the legal system works a lot quicker. We learn Marty's daughter also tried to bust out her brother and thus this entire event destroys the whole family. At this point Marty heads into the square and we watch as he walks past the re-election posters. These are done in a similar style to how Goldie Senior had them, showing that it's like father like son. As he walks forward we can catch a poster on the left before two people walk out with a hover surfboard. Later on we get a better look at this sign and can see it says Surf Vietnam. This was a little nod to Apocalypse Now without ripping off the surfing scenes that happened in that film. We've done a big breakdown on that if you want to check it out and I think it's one of the best videos on the channel so do it and tell the people you enjoyed it as well you better. Anyway from here Marty goes to the Holomax which is showing Jaws 19. This is directed by Max Spielberg with the tagline being this time it's really really personal. Universal as much as I slag them off for their copyright strikes actually put out a really funny trailer in 2015 telling the story of the franchise up until that point. Jaws made you afraid to go in the water. Jaws 2 made you afraid to go back in the water. Jaws 3D was a new dimension in terror. In Jaws 4 The Revenge, 
It was personal. Then it was just business. Then pure pleasure. Cyber Jaws made you afraid to log on. And Robo Jaws made you afraid of robotic sharks. Then Chief Brody's grandson assembled a super team of shark hunters. Jaws 10, it was man versus shark versus all the terrors of the deep. Outer space, then a prequel, and a sequel to the prequel. And then a new era in terror began. Jaws started a family. Battled a Russian shark named Ivan Sharkovsky. Took a bite out of the Big Apple and learned about love from a mysterious stranger. Jaws 18 Origins, the mind-blowing reboot. Now, the oceans are disappearing, and to save their home, the sharks must attack. Jaws 19. This time, it's really, really personal. Stevenson Max was born in 1985, without also being the year that the 80s scenes happened in. Now Back to the Future 2, of course gets reference in Endgame when Ant-Man calls it a bunch of bullshit. However, beyond that, we have a little nod to this scene with the Leviathan that's killed in Tony's snap. One ends up disappearing just before it goes to eat Rocket, with it being shot at the same angle that we get this hologram. Shark still looks fake. That line was also not a Spielberg, who, who was frustrated the shark Bruce looked so fake in Jaws that they had to cut around it. In the end, it made it more terrifying, but that movie was said to be a nightmare to film, and one day I promise that I'll cover it. Either way, Moddy also looks up at the Texaco garage, which has been a mainstay in the square. This appeared at the same spot during the 80s, and was also there during 1955. At this point, Goldie Jr. pops up advertising the hover conversion ad, which we can see shows a pink car. This ends up driving just under the sign, and we see it for real as it passes by below it. The square also has little time travel jokes as we can catch a retro store with a clock on the sign to the left of Cafe 80s. Beside the Goldie ad, we can also catch one which I can't quite make out the name, but it says travel under it. Now why I'm pointing this out is because it's in the same spot that Mr. Foster's travel store was at in the 50s, which had the line, time to travel. Marty ends up going to the window of the antique one, and we also get lots of things from the era. There's Jaws 1 and 2 on VHS, as well as a lava lamp and JFK bust. Above that we can also catch Roger Rabbit, with Zemeckis of course directing that movie. The film gets a further reference later on, with the tunnel being the same one that takes you to Toontown. In the top left there's also a denim shirt, which is actually Marty's one from the first film. If you go back to that movie, you can see he has a badge on that says Art and Revolution, which this one also carries. On top of this there's a guitar pin tag, and oh, I'm telling you, it's a bloody same shirt. And Marty did leave it, is it a jacket? It's a bloody jacket! By the way, Marty did leave it on his bed in the 80s, so hey, maybe this is a carryover from that. Lastly is a JVC camera, and though it's not the same as the one in the first film, Marty did use a camera from the same company. Now at this point we hit Cafe 80s and catch two guitars on the wall. One of these would later be played by Marty during the scene after which he gets fired. We also get one of many Michael Jackson references, with the song Beat It playing in the back. As we spin around we see his likeness is used for the waiter, with Jackson happily handing this over. Jackson was apparently such a big fan of the first film that he was extremely eager to be included in this movie. In the end they used one of his tribute acts who went by the name E. Casanova. At this point he was seen as the world's number one impersonator so it's a pretty cool inclusion to have him in the film. Later on at the alternate McFly house his posters lit the room and I counted six things, yes six things for him hanging up on the wall. There's a Thriller album cover which is over a poster of him and then on the side we've got one for off the wall. On the door is a poster for the Thriller video, and in the mirror we can catch a bigger version of the album cover. Now we also see a Max Headroom style Ronald Reagan, with Reagan of course getting mentioned in the first film. You might also notice there's some moving stars and stripes in the background which came from the Coca-Cola ad Max Headroom for President. Marty then ends up getting a Pepsi Perfect, with him attempting to order a Pepsi during the 50s. One thing they got right is that on the menu they had the product Pepsi Max, which wouldn't come to be invented until 1993. Anyway, we then cut across to Biff and watch as he stands about the booth. To the left of him we can catch the LA Times, which was reporting on Reagan's second term. Terms later get brought up in the film as we learn that Richard Nixon's serving a fifth one in the Nightmare timeline. We then get another the first movie, with Biff continuing to berate the McFlies. Hello? Hey. Hello, anybody home? Huh? Think, McFly, think! Hello? Hello, anybody home? Oh. Huh? Think, McFly? Oh. Think! Until Monday. Hello? Hello? Anybody home? Hey! Think with fly! Think! At this point we then get this. Hey Gramps! I told you two coats of wax on my car, not just one! Calling back to this line from the first film. Uh, now Biff, I want to make sure that we get two coats of wax this time, not just one. Don't bloody try and con me, Biff. 
Anyway, Griff chucks him out, and in the corner we can see the wild gunman. Is that that's bloody Elijah Wood? That that's Elijah Wood. Now, th now this would be the the actor's first role, and both he and Michael J. Fox would end up working together with Peter Jackson. Fox ended up doing the Frighteners, and would of course worked on the Lord of the Rings. Marty shows he's a crack shot, and in part three he'd end up blasting away with a real gun in the Wild Wild West. Now, though Wild Gunman is a real game, there was never an arcade cabinet for it. The graphics we also see were created just for the movie, with the real one looking slightly different. At this point, Junior stumbles in, and we get a line that flips things from the first film. It's been Sunday. Oh, McFly, your shoes untied! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> McFly! What? Your shoes on belt! <laughs> Don't be so gullible, McFly! Okay. I don't want to see you in here okay. again. I thought I told you to stay in here! Here we also meet the girl of the group Darlene, whose stunt double Cheryl Wheeler Duncan had a nasty accident. In the crash scene, she was supposed to go under the glass, but she ended up smacking into the concrete pillar. Though they cut it just before she dropped, you can clearly see her smacking up against it. Cheryl then fell 30 feet and shattered both her wrist and face. Ouch. Now Griff calls Marty a chicken, which makes him turn around, and they kind of use this as a way throughout the films to bait him into doing stuff. To be honest, I always kind of thought it was stupid, but they at least bring it full circle in the third film, when he decides to stop caring, which helps him evade the crash that would have changed his life. Now outside, Marty manages to snatch a hoverboard, which is probably this movie's most iconic piece of tech. This was originally going to be made by Swatch, but Mattel stepped in and secured the deal. Zemeckis had a laugh when promoting the movie, as he said Mattel had made them, but they just hadn't put them into production yet. He said that they managed to secure some for the film, and that they were going to be available very, very soon. Now what a fucking dickhead, mate. I'm, bl I'm bloody furious. And I bet Mattel were too, as they were constantly inundated with calls asking to buy one. For the film though, they were pretty straightforward, with the boards themselves just being planks of wood. Fox had to have his feet harnessed into the board itself, which meant that in the scenes he rides one, he was securely attached. Thus, between takes, he had to be carried back and forth, with the board still being stuck there. Now, at the time, it was reported that due to the four-year gap between films, that Fox had forgotten how to ride one, and that he had to learn how to ride one again. However, Fox has since stated this was an early symptom of his Parkinson's disease, which would later be diagnosed just two years later. We also see Griff getting out his, and if you look close, you can see it's called Pitbull. This was originally going to be named Mad Dog after Buford Tannen, but they felt that it was a bit too on the nose. Still though, this scene is brilliant, especially if you've just watched part one, with it riffing heavily on what happened in that. We even have Marty hitching onto a car, just like how he did in that first film. Causing the gang to crash in the courthouse, the future's changed and Junior is saved. Marty then goes to give the girl the board, but she says that she's now got a pit bull. This is playing off the scene in the first film in which Marty gave a young, a young Tony Hawk, let's call him, his very first skateboard. Now at this point, similar to 1985, we see someone stepping forward to try to get Marty to save the clock tower. Whereas in that, though the ledge was fine, here we can see that it's now missing. This is of course because of Doc Brown's actions, which caused it to fall away in 1955. He also says, Lightning struck that thing 60 years ago. Wait a minute. Now, you don't have to have wasted your life being a movie YouTuber to get that one, and at this moment, Marty sees the Cubs announcement. He gets the idea from Terry to go back in time and use his sports almanac to make money, money, money. Now, when looking at Terry here, yeah, I always wondered why the makeup was so bad. But, right, when digging around, I found out the reason. Turns out there's a deleted scene where Terry argues with Biff about an unpaid car repair bill. Terry said he remembered the exact date he didn't pay him, which was November 12th, 1955. This is what made Biff remember the exact date, so he knew when exactly to travel back to. Biff screwing over Terry would then get a comic response with him, then later crashing into manure again right after the dance. Anyway, we then cut to the shop and get what turns out to be a pretty important line. This has an interesting feature. It has a dust jacket. Later on, the magazine gets confiscated by Strickland, but we learn this is really a Rudy Doody mag. Shoutouts to DBZ Hero 29 on Reddit for pointing out that Biff did this on purpose to mislead anyone that was going to try and steal it. Outside, Biff then spots a DeLorean and realizes that the one from the 80s and this are the same. We also get this line. I left him in a suspended animation kennel. Einstein never knew I was gone. Which was just thrown in to fill a plot hole as Doc drove off to the future with Einstein in the car. When he returned home, the dog was missing, so they just put this in to explain why he wasn't there. Anyway, Doc then steps out in a change of clothes, which has some brilliant foreshadowing on it. 
We can see a steam train from the wild wild west and can also catch horses riding alongside it. This is done to foreshadow part 3 in which they hijack one from the wild west. And what's an amazing bit of attention to detail, we see Doc actually wearing the shirt itself as a bandana in the film when he and Marty hold up the train. As I've been saying, it's all connected, and if you want to support the channel, then pick up some of our all connected merch, which you can catch right below the video. Now, Junior is saved with us seeing the US Today camera drone dropping in and taking the photo that appears on the paper itself. Realizing that he's got the almanac, Doc then goes to bin it, which is when we see Jennifer getting picked up. The officer on the right is actually played by Mary Ellen Trainer, who at the time was Zemeckis' real wife. With them preoccupied with that, Biff then puts his plan into action and we catch the police car driving to Hilldale. As they shine the flashlight, it lights up the sign and we can see what the tagline for the area is. It was supposed to be the address of success, but bloody vandals have changed that to suckers. Sort of hints to how Marty's life's turned out and we learn that the area is a pretty rough neighbourhood. Be careful in the future. Uh, I get it. Did you get her? Life hasn't turned out how they expected though, with a pair getting married in a chapel of love. They also have to watch the scenery channel, so the allure of the almanac becomes even more. Michael even ends up playing his daughter, and luckily it's so distracting you don't even realise that that's not Crispin. When Jennifer first comes in, she also says, Mom? Mom, is that you? I gotta get out of here. Which is the same line spoken by Marty when he wakes up confused about where he is in the first film. In the car, we see his Doc grabs onto his visor and says that he thinks he sees a taxi following. At this point, you can also clearly spot he has two wristwatches on, showing how obsessed with time that he is. Back in the house, we learn that Marty bust up the scenery screen after the guy who installed it called him Chicken, and we learn how much this word is very triggering for him. About 30 years ago, your father tried to prove he wasn't Chicken, and he ended up in an automobile accident. Oh, you mean with the Rolls Royce? This Rolls Royce pops up at the end of part 3 and shows how he narrowly managed to avoid that path. Now when Junior returns home, we see how he turns on some channels and in the top right, we can see one for breast implants. Potentially, this is foreshadowing what Lorraine would be forced into and she ends up getting them in the alternate timeline. This timeline then gets created when we watch Biff taking the DeLorean. Biff doing this is given away when we see the inside of the car later on as we can catch the date last visited on the bottom line. Had they picked up on this, then they'd have realised someone else had been in the car and instantly figure out exactly what had happened. Back in the house, we see them cooking a pizza, which has the Pizza Hut logo on the front of the packet. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, Pizza Hut wanted the brand to look good, so they provided a professional food stylist for each and every take. They also installed a proper pizza kitchen at the south and made up new ones for every single shot. At this point, he's egged on by Needles, who's played by Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. This is immediately caught by the boss, and he's fired on the spot. Now there's a little detail that gives away Needles was in on it, as we can catch him looking off as the call ends, which is likely to the boss. McFly's boss is also Japanese, which was due to the country's dominance when it came to industry. This was in a time in which lots of our items were made in Japan, and both this and Blade Runner predicted them being world leaders in technology. I think at the heart of this though, is that it hammers home the message of the movie, which is about the dangers of trying to get rich quick. Marty Jr. is arrested because he goes in on the scheme and Marty of course tries to grab the almanac. Here we also see him getting roped into doing it again and all of the outcomes just lead to disaster. Jennifer then encounters herself, we see as Biff rolls in and in a nice bit of attention to detail, you can catch ice coming off the top of the car like how it did in part 1. Doc also foreshadows his actions in the future as he talks about going back to the old west. My only regret is that I'll never get a chance to visit my favourite the old west. He says this is to study the greatest mystery in the universe, women, with that basically being what his arc centres around in part 3. We can also catch Biff thrashing away, which is of course because he got a raise from time. Now because of this, people have wondered why that Biff's still not around. Technically, he would still exist after the time change, he'd just be different to the old man that he was here. Gale and Zemeck has actually put things in place to clear this up, and they were going to reveal something in an earlier draft. We would learn that Lorraine shot Biff in 96, which explain why the Biff years started to vanish, like my subscribers now that comic book movies aren't popular. Returning back to 1985, there is a couple of signs straight away that something's amiss. As they pull in, we can see a battered car in a driveway and trash piling out of every bin. As they go to drop Jennifer off, we can also see a total car on hers with bars on the windows. Now, what I love, well, I shouldn't say love, what I find funny is that they just drop Jennifer off on her porch, leave her there and say, 
Ah, uh, if we sort stuff out, it'll be fine, mate. No need to worry about Jennifer. Just leave her on the porch in hell and go change the timeline. And in the end, it'll, look, it'll just work itself out. Like, come on, mate. I don't know if that would be the case. And I would have found it hilarious if they got Claudia Wells back to show up in part three like nothing was wrong. But alas, they don't do that and they just dump her in the bad timeline. We then cut over to Lightness Day, which is filled with graffiti and stray dogs. We can also catch multiple for sale signs outside every house, and it looks like these belong to Biff. Though they're difficult to make out, that does look like his logo, and Marty's the only one without a sign outside of it. Oh, straight, you keep running, sucker! And you tell that realty company that I ain't selling, you hear? Thus, this makes sense with Biff taking over the town. I feel like the family scene is kind of playing off the Peabody scene, in which he gets chased into the night. He ends up making it out to Strickland's, who holds him up at gunpoint, and in the end we discover the school burned down. In the 4K version, you can make out there's a scar over his eyes, and then his house is shot up showing what Biff's leadership's like. Hill Valley has become Hell Valley, and we once more get a return of Red Thomas. Crazy drunk driver. In case you missed our last video, Red was the mayor in 1955 who ended up homeless after losing his job. The clock tower has now been turned into a monument to Biff, but hey, at least, at least he fixed the ledge. Still though, the strip clubs are in full effect, tanks are on the street, and we discover that smoking's required if you want to go inside. Seeing his black car outside the hotel, we then learn of Biff's life since the timeline change. We also get a moment showing Buford Tannen setting up the third film's villain. He ends up looking a bit different how he does in part 3, with this being an early makeup test. Dubbed the luckiest man on earth, he's used his fortune to legalise gambling, and in the end has managed to build an empire. Dating Marilyn Monroe, he ended up marrying his high school sweetheart, which even old Biff still had his eye on. Hey kid, say hello to your grandma for me. Hey, no. Say hi to your mom for me. Grabbed by matches, 3D, and the other one, we then see his Marty's escorted upstairs. You can catch that 3D is once more wearing 3D glasses, but in the 50s these were made of cord. Man's now going up in the world though, as he has proper frames for this, and Match also still has this match in his mouth, and we then get this bit. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. The easy way. Always kind of made me wonder who was saying the easy way, but shout out to Niall7658 on Red Air for pointing this out. If you speed up the easy way bit, you can actually hear it's Michael J. Fox. The easy way. Also, I love how the easy way is just knocking him out, because in the world of Biff, the hard way ain't good. Waking up in bed with his mother at his side, the scene of course riffs on the one from the first film with her nursing him awake. Sat up in bed, I love how most of the actions play off that scene, with Lorraine now being scared of Biff instead of fearing her mother. Lorraine! Oh my god, it's your father! <laughs> Living in what's got the decor of Scarface's mansion, we see Lorraine stumble over to a lot of bottles. Beside this, we can catch a tape called Black Taboo, which was an adult movie that was about incest. I don't know why all these movies have something like that, but here we are. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Now we discover that, though Lorraine wants to go, Biff's bankrolling her kids. This includes Linda, who was originally going to be a lady of the night. However, Wendy Jo Sperber was pregnant at the time, so they thought the optics of that, it, it might be a bit bad. You bet, you're better off just sticking with incest, mate. That's much better. Either way, Joey is mentioned as being behind bars, with this also being a carryover from the first film. In the end, Moddy finds out his dad's dead, and we see as he goes to visit his grave. This lists his date of birth as April 1st, giving an idea that his life was a joke. You might also notice that he died on the Ides of March, which is known as a day in which you settle debts. Smart. We can also see the factories behind Marty burning in the back, showing how Biff turned it into an industrial wasteland. Joined by Doc, we see a newspaper chronicling his death and get some hints as to what the world's like. There's a standoff with some Native Americans, which was put in place to foreshadow Marty coming across them during part 3. You also see a bit about the Watergate revelations, which in the end changed the fate of Nixon. On the left, we can see that there's a strike with oil workers and a record number of new claims for unemployment filed. The main page becomes important as, like the photograph, it shows when the future's been changed. Doc then shows that in this reality he's been committed, which was something that was foreshadowed earlier in the film. Changes over the years, they simply assume she's the Jennifer of the future. No. 
Well, we gotta stop him. What are we gonna say? That we're time travelers they have us committed. I know you can also take it as Biff getting him out of the way, but I just thought that it was interesting that they had this line earlier. Either way, Marty flips the paper around, we get Nixon, and a headline about how there's a pollution alert in Hill Valley. Lastly, if you check out the bottom one, you'll see that Biff Co has taken over Lone Pine Mall. That's Lone Pine because the events of the first film still happen, with George beating Biff up at the end. This is why Lorraine said Biff would never be the man George was, because she'd known him in his more heroic incarnation. Dorsey explains why he had him kill, because George had been the one standing up to him. Returning to Biff's, we then get this line. How'd you get past my security downstairs? And as we see, Marty came in the DeLorean, explaining how he managed to make it past. They bring up the lightning strike, the car getting rolled in manure, and also the crazy man that showed up with the book. Marty also grabs some matches, before things lead into Biff blowing off his gun. Racing downstairs, I, I always appreciated how slick it was with Marty jumping across staircases in order to escape. Getting to the roof, he manages to make it out, with the DeLorean being held in the air through using fibre wire so that it appeared invisible. Back in the DeLorean, we see the time circuit display flash 1885, foreshadowing where Doc will go at the end of the film. Arriving at Lion Estates, they then park the car where the original DeLorean was hidden. At this point though, the older version was moved to the lab, explaining why this spot is now vacant. We also get a repeat of the blocking that was used in part 1, with one character running close to the camera, while the other one runs into the background. Opening up a suitcase full of money, we can also see Doc has cash from different eras. When I paused this, I was wondering why there were two bills for 1864, and not being up on my American history, I did a little Google search. So it turns out, this is actually due to the Civil War, which had two types of currency out in circulation. Really nice attention to detail, with showing how prepared that doc is. At Biff Grandma's Gertrude Tannen, we also hear Thomas F. Wilson providing her voice. Where are you going, Biff? I'm going to get my car, Grandma! When are you coming back? Cutting to the town square from the 50s, we see Terry with Biff arguing over the money. Again, this would have made more sense with the deleted scene, and explain all that terrible old man makeup. Biff also says that only he knows how to start that car, which is something older Biff later does to get him into trusting him. At this point, Biff spots Lorraine, who we see excited over a new dress. This was something that was also a bit of a nightmare because the crew had gotten rid of most of the clothes from the first film. This of course included Lorraine's dresses, namely the spare ones they kept in case one got damaged. However, Leah Thompson revealed that she'd kept one and actually had to drive home to get it for the shoot. Biff declares his love for Lorraine, she says she wouldn't date him even if he had a million, and you, you can see how th those lines play off down the line. And from here, Biff's taken to the garage, in which he interacts with his other self. These scenes were shot using the Vista Glide, which at the time w was completely groundbreaking. It allowed actors to play multiple parts in the same scene, and have them all blend together seamlessly, bar a few little moments. Earlier in the movie at the McFly's, we had Fox playing three different characters in one scene, which was the first time it had ever been pulled off in a film. That shot was divided into three parts, whereas here they used the middle of the windscreen to help mask the coverage. Biff then says, Now why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? So why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? It's leave, you idiot. Make like a tree and leave. You sound like a damn fool when you say it wrong. Also, once Biff correctly shows the results, we can see as the older one starts to disappear. As he hands over the book at roughly the one hour nine mark, you can see his arm starts to fade away. This is similar to how Marty's handed in the first film, showing how things have now been changed. This was then going to be expanded on in a deleted scene where we'd see Biff completely disappear. Instead, they just had him writhing around in pain, but that shows him completely fading from existence while Einstein barks at him. Across town, Doc then talks to himself while his past version sets up the machine. Now obviously, when you have moments like this, people often go back to check if they took extras from the background of the first film and wreck on them to be Doc. Going back, fans have speculated that you can catch someone in Doc's clothes, and thus I went back to check for myself. However, I'm not sure if that's the case, as we can only catch two people in a trench coat and hat. One of them is at the 1 hour 16 mark, but this guy isn't wearing the same colour as Doc. The other is at 1 hour 15, 55, and as Marty writes a letter, we can see someone in the street who looks a bit similar. However, he's not with his bike, so yeah, I think people are just dreaming. Dreaming like me when I said the hand disappeared, even though most people say it's just the Vista Glide. But let me dream, yeah? Anyway, at the dance, we of course see George doing his best nutty professor, and also Biff who then goes outside. Reading Ooh La La, this would end up being what he puts the dust jacket on. 
When Moddy goes to grab the almanac from his pocket, we can see that it doesn't have it, showing that he likely always planned to slip this on over it. This then sends Moddy on a big wild goose chase, in which he has to sneak past himself. I think it's these moments that really make the movie work, and it's so cool seeing the first film played from another angle. As he goes to Strickland's, we can also see a sign above the door, which you can see says SS Strickland. Now this was obviously put in as a reference to how harsh he was, with it being an odd to his heavy-handed totalitarian rule. However, according to IMDb Trivia, it was later altered in the game to be Stanford S. Strickland when we learn more about the character. On his desk, we can also catch the Stars and Stripes, which has the correct 48 stars in it for what would have been the case in 55. Finally, getting the book back, he realises the truth, and we see as the scene plays out where George saves Lorraine. The guy says, Room, okay, a little bit of air. It's okay, I know CPR. I know CPR. Hey. What's CPR? And this is due to this not being invented until 1960. We then see Doc taking off in the car, which bumps against the line estate sign. This is what then triggers the malfunction and sets the path for him to go back in time. Now, originally, they had a scene that tied in the first movie, and this would be caused by old man Peabody. Now, the details on this are a bit sketchy, but from what I could gather, Peabody had been considered insane after telling everyone about the town that he'd seen a spaceship. He'd be put in an asylum, but then let out, which is when he spotted the DeLorean in the sky. Both the police and Peabody would then start shooting at it, which is why it would end up being damaged. This was removed by the time they got to the later drafts, with them simplifying it to just being a crash. Marty also has to intervene with stopping himself from being attacked in the past, and he drops a sandbag on Biff's gang. I love how they're just standing there waiting to beat on him, but also tapping away to the beat, because Johnny B. Good is so good. We also see Marvin going to the phone, which as we know would be him calling up his cousin Chuck. Marty makes his way outside, which is when he's confronted by Biff, and he ends up being knocked out by his past self exiting the building. So well put together, and it just ramps up the tension, because you know that they're on a ticking clock too. Chasing him across town, we hear there's an incoming storm on the radio, which, as we know, would come to hit the clock tower. A severe thunderstorm is heading for Hill Valley. Marty and Biff wrestle back and forth with a bug, which then leads to Biff getting covered in manure. So from this point onward, the timeline's changed, and Big Bad Biff would never get power. He'd never get to kill George, never build the casinos, never get implicated in the list, never force Lorraine to marry him, and never control Marty's life. From this point, they then travel back to Lion Estates, where both the matches and newspaper slowly start to change. This turns Biff's casino back to his order detailing, which is of course a job he worked in the secondary timeline. George McFly is now being honoured, and Doc Brown's commended instead of being committed. You can also see the Nixon to seek a fifth term has him vowing to end the Vietnam War by 1985. This then changes to Reagan, with Biff Co also being changed to a story about the town's mayor. However, after a lightning strike, the DeLorean sends him off into the past, and at this point we can see what looks like a burning backwards 99. Many have thought this represents how many years were travelled, but mate, I'll be honest with you, the math ain't mathin. Since then, Gail has explained that this is because of the wheels of the DeLorean, which were spinning so fast it caused this in the sky. Either way, Marty gets a letter which just so happens to be delivered while it's raining, bringing together both the postal service and weather like what we talked about before. Guess they were efficient in the end, and they've held on to it for 70 years. Revealing Doc's back in 1885, Marty races back to the clock tower, and if I was this guy, I'd be like, what? <laughs> I'm following him, I want to I know more. Here we see his past version travel back, which of course I'm shaking guess Paul's from the first film. Love the way that they kind of play this scene out, and then just have Marty racing up to him after he just disappeared. You can spot the fire lines when we cut to the new shots, but hey, I'm not mad at you. And we end with Doc fainting as we close out part 2. This then leads into a trailer for part 3, showing the frolicking adventure that we're gonna get next. This is easily one of my favourite Clint Eastwood films, and in it we see as Marty desperately tries to save Doc. Now the entire premise of the movie was set up by a line in part 2, in which Doc talked about what his hopes and dreams were. My favourite historical era, the old west, the time travelling, is just too dangerous. Better than I devote myself studying the other great history of the universe. Women. Not only does he get to go back in time, but he also gets to meet the love of his life. There's a lot to uncover, unpack, and talk about, and great Scott, I can't wait to get into it. So come with me, my partner in time, smash that thumbs up button, and let us get into Back to the Future 3. <laughs> Now, 
Unlike the gap between part 1 and 2, part 3 was all pretty much in place when it came to production. Shot back to back, this latter film didn't have the issues that the first two did in terms of recasting people like Eric Stoltz and Crispin Glover. Everything was locked in and ready to go, but with it being two movies, there was still a lot to get through. Both were filmed together in the course of 11 months, with Zemeckis having to shoot part 3 while editing part 2. Nowadays, you could just do it online digitally on your laptop, but back then they had to have physical film reels and also big editing rooms. Zemeckis would film part 3, finish for the day, fly out to Burbank and then work on the edit. He'd then make the changes, go to sleep and fly back to Cali to shoot part 3. Going on for about a month, this is something he said wiped him out, but he managed to get the two films released within a year of each other. Anyway, that's his short but sweet making of trivia, and that takes us back to the future. And the film begins with the first showing of the 75th anniversary Universal logo. Not only was this the company celebrating the last 75 years of its work, but it also thematically helps to set the stage for the film. We will of course be going back through the ages to witness how things all began in the town of Hill Valley. Picking up immediately after part 2, we begin like the last two did with the date at the bottom displaying when this is. In it we get the ending of part 1, and then watch as Marty goes back to the future. This then segues into part 2's final scene, and we get Doc Brown's collapse. A really cool thing you can do here though, is that you can actually end part 1, and then jump from here immediately to part 3. Seeing these from Doc's perspective, you can just watch these back to back, and then learn about what happened in part 2 directly from Marty. Don't do it mate, don't bloody do it you sicko, going from 1 to 3, uh, but it shows how well crafted these films are in terms of cohesiveness. After the title sequence, we then cut to the sky, juxtaposing the bright clouds that opened up part 2. This thematically showed a possible sunny future, whereas in this instance, it symbolises the darkness with the way the film ended. Returning to Doc Brown's home, we then get some cool easter eggs that reference the first film. In Doc's garage at the start, we could see four science figures, with this being Isaac Newton, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Edison, and lastly Albert Einstein. Cut to Doc's home in 1955, and he also had these images right above the fireplace. These return in the exact same spot, and we then cut down to see the letter Doc wrote being dried out on the fire. There's the hoverboard, the dog Copernicus, and we then cut to the TV playing Howdy Doody. This was a kid's show set in the Old West, foreshadowing the trip that Marty makes throughout the movie. The theme of the show was initially in the first screenplay draft for part 1, before it was changed out for that long opening one shot. After realising Marty's there, he then backs into the bathroom, and we can see a clock hanging up on the wall. Cut back to part one. I was standing on the edge of my toilet, hanging a clock. The porcelain was wet. I slipped, hit my head on the edge of the sink. And when I came to, I had a revelation, a vision, a picture in my head, a picture of this. This is what makes time travel possible. And this is the same clock that he was referring to then. Going into the garage, we can then see a fire extinguisher that was used in part one to put out the fire caused by the model. This was notably almost empty, explaining how Doc's house burned down, which we learned from that news report. The model car is then shown at 8 minutes and 54, when we see Marty pull it out the bin. You also get the crude model of Hill Valley, before then cutting to the mind reading machine Doc wore in that film. This room is a perfect recreation of it, with the model even having Doc's wrist watching the clock tower. This is set at 10.04, which is when the lightning strike hit it. This is given further reference at 41.52, when we can see the clock face in the background at the train station. This is set at 10.04, which brings things full circle from how it starts and ends. And it's all connected. Like Back with Doc, he finishes his letter, and we can see two watches on his wrists. This is something the character wears throughout the franchise, again showing his big obsession with time. Now technically, this should start on the timeline that creates something else in 1985. So far we've had the original one, and then the Lone Pine Mall one from the end of part 1. Part 2 had the alternate 85 before Marty went back and changed things to the end of part 3. That means that this moment didn't alter the timeline and that it was actually always meant to happen. I think, and it's lots of timey wimey wibbly wobbly stuff, but if you view this in that way it makes more sense. Doc ended up ripping Marty's letter at the end of part 1, but we saw that he'd put it back together. I think I'm getting a letter from himself here, maybe what could have changed his mind, but yeah, that's probably me retconning it because I doubt they planned it out that much. However, oh, that does make it slightly more enjoyable, and he also leaves himself a note saying, Remember to walk him twice a day, and that he only likes canned dog food. This is something that we saw piling up at the start of part one, and I do appreciate that they kind of went back and referenced this. And from this point, they go out to the cemetery, which is where they dig up the DeLorean. We hear Doc say, That's by the time I attempted to reach the center of the earth, I've been reading my favorite author, Jules Verne. 
And these lines are very important as it lays the seeds for his duels for an obsession. Clara later says she's a fan of him too, and we watch as the pair start to bond over him. When the pair return in the future, we also meet their kids, which we learn are called both Jules and Vern. Beyond that though, this speech has a little Easter egg, as Zark talks about one of his favourite books. That is... Just like in Journey to the Centre of the Earth! Which the future Doc references in How He Buries the Car. In the novel, a professor and his nephew went to the centre of the Earth, and they were following clues left by an adventurer. In order to lead them into the passages, he engraved his initials, which were AS. This is something that Doc Brown does too, as we see his initials ELB carved into the wood. After finding the DeLorean, they see the chip and Doc says, No wonder this circuit failed, it says made in Japan. Japan of course dominated the economy in the 80s, and Mod even worked for a Japanese corporation during part 2. Now from this point they discover Doc's grave, and we can see that the death date's September 7th. In the film, Doc was actually shot on September 5th, meaning that it took another two days for him to die. From this point on, they then study Buford Tannen, who got a little cameo during part 2. This had him with a slightly different look, as the photo used here was an early makeup test. Gale wanted Buford to represent Biff's worst intentions, realising a person who could do what they wanted. Looking at films, they based him on Liberty Valance from the classic western The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Why don't you get yourself a fresh steak on me? Show's over for now. Eight o'clock Monday, bro. If you ain't here, I'll hunt you and shoot you down like a duck. We then see the history of the McFlies, with Marty then saying, I have family. Your relatives? My great grandfather's name was William. That's him. Good looking guy. Guy is obviously played by Fox, foreshadowing how he also plays Seamus as well. The one in the book is a man called William, who Marty later meets as a baby in his crib. This is a scene that calls back to his uncle Joey, who he also met as a kid during part one. Doc also mentions his family name was the Von Browns, which is a reference to the scientist Werner Von Braun. This is one of Germany's leading rocket scientists who got brought to the US during Operation Paperclip. Marty then looks through some photos, with one of a woman being of a saloon girl. She's called Dolores Miskin, with her possibly being a relation to Sylvia Miskin. In the game we met her and learned that she was George's mother, tying it all together from this little photograph. To the right of her we can also see the saloon, which is a location that we go to in the film. Lastly we see the photo of Doc Brown, who at that point poses in front of the new clock. The time on it says 8.08, with IMDb trivia stating this is a reference to 88 miles per hour. At this point, Marty then vows to save him, and we see as he brings up your boy Clint Eastwood. Hey, who? That's right. You haven't heard of him yet. Now look what Marty does at that moment, mate, and you can see that he points at the wall. Going back a bit, we can see that this is him pointing at posters, which are for Tarantula and Revenge of the Creature. Both of these featured a young Clint Eastwood who, at the time, hadn't made his name yet. Eastwood gets a lot of deep cuts in the film, with Marty using his moves to help save his life. During part 2, Biff watched a fistful of dollars, which had him using a makeshift bulletproof vest. This is something Marty does in the film as well, with him using a metal stove door during their duel. When Doc shoots Marty down from the hanging rope, it's also something Eastwood's character did in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. This is how he rescued the character Tuco, who was also made to hang from a rope as well. Pale Rider was shot at the same place that this was, with them even using some of the buildings for the background of Hill Valley. On top of that, we also have Eastwood Ravine, which is what we see the sign say at the end of the film. This was formerly known as Clayton Ravine because it's where Clara Clayton was originally going to fall into. Eastwood was asked for permission to use his name, which he gave after saying that he really loved the reference. Now the idea to hit the Wild West actually came from Fox when they were on set joking about where things could go. Fox said that he'd love to hit the Old West and have Marty and Doc dressed up as cowboys. There was the idea that they could go there in the second film, but Zemeckis wanted to delay it until we got to part 3. They also realised when crafting the script that they'd gotten everything out of Marty that they felt that they could get. Thus the attention was turned to Doc Brown, with a love story being crafted out of the character Clara Clayton. This was written with Mary Steenburgen in mind, who'd previously been in the film time after time. This was also centred around time travel, with it having elements set in San Francisco. They gave a little nod to this during the script when they say, How far does the 8 o'clock train go? Well, San Francisco is the end of the line. Although this was written with her in the part, Mary initially turned down the role. However, her kids wouldn't let it drop, and eventually they convinced her to take part in the film. Beyond this, Zemeckis and Gale also wanted to pay tribute to the genre, which in the 90s had kind of died out. 
however, it did get somewhat of a revival with Dances with Wolves winning the best picture the next year. Unforgiven was about to roll into production, and you could argue that this dropped at the right time. So Zemeckis, he looked at getting in veteran actors who would be notable faces that people recognise from the westerns. In the saloon we have the quote unquote old timers who are played by Pat Buttram, Harry Carey Jr and lastly Dub Taylor. These were pushed in the behind the scenes stuff to show how much attention they were paying to the genre. Ronald Reagan was also approached for the film too with the idea he'd play the mayor of Hill Valley. Reagan's someone who we, we've talked a lot about in these breakdowns and if you want to hear about those stories then go back to our part 1 video. He was then included in part 2 with the hopes then being that he'd show up in the flesh for the third and final film. Unfortunately, he ended up declining, which is a shame due to how much his notoriety in westerns would have made his cameo pop. Now back with Doc, he says, For all, we can't risk sending you back into a populated area or to a spot that's geographically unknown. You don't want to crash into some tree that once existed in the past. This is a little nod to the first film, as in that, Moddy ended up crashing into Peabody's tree, which changed them all's name. He also says, Remember where you're going, there are no roads. You get it, you get it, mate, with it being a callback to this line. Where we're going, we don't need roads. Driving at the sign, we, th we then get what's probably my favourite time travel transition in the entire trilogy. Heading at the Native Americans, this is then turned into real life ones, being at that spot in the past. After encountering the cavalry, we see that they have a flag with 31 stars on it, which is what was carried at the time. Unfortunately, the fuel line's been damaged though, and Moddy's then chased out the cave by a bear. Now, not to be a dickhead, mate, not to be a dick. But this plot hole, it, it always did my head in a bit. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. You see, the fuel leaking, it means they can't get it up to top speed, and thus they have to rely on the train. However, 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 there's actually two DeLoreans in the past right now. The first of these is the one Moddy's driving, but there's also the one that Doc Brown arrived in. This is the one that he buries underground, and they end up digging up in the future. So technically, the pair could go out and get this, get the fuel, and then from there travel back. At this point, Moddy then comes across his ancestor's farm, and he ends up crashing into a fence. On his shirt, we can also see the Adam symbol, which is something that was first observed during the 1880s. Knocked out, we then get a scene that's sort of like poetry they rhyme. This is Moddy waking up and being nursed by Leah Thompson, which is something that happened in the prior two films. Now Leah, or her character, being married to Seamus, I, I don't even want to go down that rabbit hole, and how Mrs McFly also looks like his mother. His dad m must have married his cousin, uh, look we're not going to go that way, uh, and that's the last I want to say about that. Anyway, Seamus busts in carrying some rabbits, with the pair then talking about them over their supper. This again was shot using the Vista Glide, which allowed an actor to play two characters in the same scene. This is something that was difficult to pull off, and even in Terminator 2, they ended up hiring twins to get around the problem. Yep, Linda Hamilton as a twin, and that's how she's able to do it in the scene at the end. Terminator 2, right down on the channel right now. Why? Now Marty also ends up spitting out the ball bearings which came from the gun that was used to kill the rabbits. After a good night's sleep, Marty travels into town which is where we get the classic shot of him coming across Hill Valley. This is obviously shot in a similar way across the trilogy with a camera pulling up to then reveal the town. Beyond that we also get a little cool detail which we can see with Joe Statler's horses. Statler's Studebaker Motors appeared in 1955 and it could be seen just after Marty travels back to 85. As he walks in further, we can see the A. Jones manure wagon, which, like the McFlies, was kept in the family. We'll not, we'll not go down that rabbit hole though, but uh, jump over to 1955, and the name on the manure truck says D. Jones. Lastly is the Wells Fargo building, who are a bank that still operate today. However, by 55 they left the premises, with this now becoming the Bluebird Motel. I did try looking up the Marshalls sign with Stinky Lomax, but unfortunately I couldn't find any trivia. How about what we get to Saloon, which is in the exact same spot as Lou's Diner. This ended up becoming Cafe Eddie's, and at this point the barman says, You want water? You better go dunk your head in the horse trough. Now after Doc ends up getting the wake up juice, the first thing he does is run outside and do this in order to get some water. Either way, he kind of carries on the trope of Marty, ordering the wrong thing. Frank, give me a Pepsi free. You want a Pepsi, pal? You're going to pay for it. Ah, uh, I'll have uh, ice water. Now on top of this, we get the repeating moment in the franchise, in which a tannin walks in and says, Hey McFly! Hey Gramps! Hey McFly! Now you might also notice that Biff's gang is different, and this was done for practical reasons. All of these were highly skilled horsemen, so shooting these scenes would become a lot easier. It's way easier to teach someone to act than it is to ride a horse, and it, it kind of reminds me of the, 
the Armageddon DVD commentary. I asked Michael why it was easier to train oil drillers to become astronauts than it was to train astronauts to become oil drillers, and he told me to shut, shut, shut the fuck up. So that, that was the end of that talk. He was like, you know, Ben, just shut up, okay? You know, this is a real plan, all right? I was like, you mean it's a real plan at NASA to train oil drillers? He was like, just shut your mouth. <laughs> anyway, this time Biff ends up shooting at his feet and we watch his Marty moonwalks. Part 2 referenced him quite heavily with him appearing in Cafe Eddie's and the girls' room in the Nightmare Timeline of 1985. Chasing in the street, we then see the hanging, which is something that actually nearly killed Fox. Unfortunately, because of YouTube censorship, we can't show these hanging scenes, but I, I thought I'd at least just go over what happens in them. Now, the white shot's on him, but when filming the close-ups, the creative team decided they had to get right up to him. They did a couple of shots without the box, and the rope around his neck, with his hands reaching up to hold in between the noose. Unfortunately, on the third try, he miscalculated the position, and ended up misplacing his hand. This caused him to block an artery, and in the end, it made him pass out. After this, Fox started getting a twitching little finger, which he stated wouldn't go away. In his biography, Lucky Man, he said he then went to the doctors, believing that this was caused by the stunt. After numerous doctor visits, he was told it could be linked to that, but then the condition worsened and spread throughout his body. Eventually, he was sadly diagnosed with Parkinson's, but it was said that the stunt wasn't linked in with it. It's really sad, and often is a talking point of this scene, so I thought I'd clear that up because I know there's lots of different things said about it. Now from this point, Doc ends up saving him, which is when Buford warns him he'll get a bullet in his back. No prices for guessing what that is, and in Doc's lab we see he's constructed a massive ice machine. The mayor arrives and reminds him about picking up a teacher, which is of course how he meets Clara. Now in what's a great little detail, we can see her before she's properly introduced in the scene at 4151. If you look closely just behind Marty, you will see Clara standing with her back turned. She's someone who was supposed to get picked up from here, but with that not happening, she then went into the ravine. This is even given to us in a line when he's going over the map, talking about what the original name was. This map calls Clayton Ravine Shonash Ravine. That must be the old Indian name for it. As we know, they ended up saving Clara, and in the end it's Marty who's thought to have gone over it. Mentioned it before, but that's why Clayton becomes Eastwood, but in saving her, it doesn't really change the timeline. Clara is someone who can be taken away by Doc because in either possible outcome, she's not present beyond this point. Had she went into the ravine or got taken out of time, nothing in the future would have been changed. Doc wasn't originally there, which is why she went over, and this explains why Doc calls it Clayton Ravine. The second instance was when he picked her up and then got shot in the back by Buford Tannen. The third timeline is the one where Moddy goes back to help and then helps Doc, who also saves Clara. So that's why Doc thinks it's called Clayton Ravine, even though her name also appeared on his grave. I know people think it's a paradox, but it's lots of timey-wimey wibbly-wobbly stuff, and I do, I must admit, I love the detail of her just standing at the station. It's kind of fate, and even though Doc initially decides to completely avoid her, we see what it leads to in the end. Marty describes love at first sight being like lightning. You meet the right girl, it just hits you, it's like lightning. Marty, please don't say that. And this is because Doc had to deal with it on the clock tower, and it's also what sent him back during part two. Realising there's no way to get the car up to 88, they then try horse riding, making gasoline, and finally settle on the train. Now, another nitpick people have is that once Buford's taken out, there's not really any reason for them to rush the train plot. I suppose, mate, but it's a movie and it needs, needs a ticking clock, needs some excitement at the end, rather than just them sitting around and being like, well, tons out of the way, let's take time to build a time machine. I think even fourth dimensionally, they realise they can travel across the ravine and land safely in 1985. Saving Clara though, Doc then tormented, and we get a classic head of heart story, which, ah, young love. Now Doc wants to make up for the cart being destroyed, and he says, I feel somewhat responsible for what happened. This is because the man left her at the station, and yet nearly got that poor woman killed. Either way, this gets him more into her life, but he's torn between just letting go of her or subscribing in the end, which he should always do. Anyway, at this point, we get a crude model of the town. I apologize for the crudity of this model, but yeah, I just... Yeah, no, Dark, it's not the scale. This is a callback to this. Please excuse the crudity of this model. I didn't have time to build it to scale or to paint it. It's good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Guys may do with what they had at the time, including bullet casings on the back of the model car. Now, according to the wiki for the movie, Clara was a reference to Mark Twain's daughter, who was called Clara Clemens. According to the story, she was riding horseback, and then the animal got frightened and dashed towards a cliff. Saved by her fiancé, he managed to catch up to them and stopped her from going over the 50-foot drop. 
After a visit from Clayton, that man wants to start dating, and from here we head to the town festival. Starting at the clock, we see his fireworks like the tower, which were purposely put in to mirror the lightning strikes. So we've had a flash and a bang when it started ticking, and this would also be there when it ended up stopping. Doc and Marty then end up getting a photo together, which is taken by the movie's director of photography, the legendary Dean Cundy. Marty says, Smile, Doc. While he doesn't. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, this is because at the time, people didn't smile in photographs. So Marty's, he's bloody, he's bloody pulling his leg. He's made you look a right knob. And from here we cut to the band, which are headed up by ZZ Top. They do their signature spin, and apparently ended up playing for the cast in between takes. According to the behind the scenes wiki, the ZZ Top manager apparently tried to get them to use their famous car for this film. This was turned down because they already had the DeLorean, but it did make an appearance in the band's music video for the film, which is called Double Back. We can also hear that to buy a cold peacemaker costs $12, showing how inflation or well deflation changed the prices of the time. Marty shows his skills calling back to part 2, and this is riffing off from when he played Gundam. The guy running it also says, I just told you that even a baby can handle this weapon. Surely you're not afraid to try something that a baby can do. With the kids in part two saying, That's like a baby's toy. At this point, Buford's gang roll into town, where we meet Marshal Strickland. A, he's back, and after he gets them to hand over their weapons, he says this to his son. Remember that word. Discipline. Cut back to part two, and we can see the word discipline under Strickland's name at the hour 19 mark. Passed down through the generations, the man's been handing out discipline, and we were originally going to see him die in this film. When Buford's arrested, this is carried out by his deputy, rather than being by Marshal Strickland himself. This is because Buford was originally arrested for the murder of Strickland, which he'd do by shooting him in the back. They had to redub the line, saying that he'd killed him, and they masked this change by cutting to Doc and Marty. Buford Tannen, you're under arrest for robbing the Pine City stage. You got anything to say? I just thought it was too depressing, and hey, it's a fun movie, mate. You don't want to hear about marshals getting murdered and shot in the back while a kid watches on. Anyway, at the dad's, we see Marty holds up a plate with frisbee on air that he later uses as a way to stop Buford. This is a callback to what he did in part two, when we saw him throw the matches holder at the evil Biff. However, beyond this, we see it's a pie pan, which is a neat little bit of history for you guys to learn now. You see, the frisbee pie company, that was a real thing, with them operating during the late 1800s. It was then discovered these pans were thrown for fun, and hence the frisbee, it was officially invented. I said that's 10, you gutless yellow pie slinger! Saving Doc, Marty's put into the crosshairs, with him then being called yellow. They repeat the scene from part 2, with the same blocking that Marty had when 55 Biff called him a chicken at the dance. He also gets a saying wrong, I'll hunt you and shoot you down like a duck. It's dog, Buford. Shoot him down like a dog. Calling back to how Biff kept messing up the tree thing. Now why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? So why don't you make like a tree and get out of here? It's leave, you idiot. Make like a tree and leave. You sound like a damn fool when you say it wrong. Oh, Learning from Seamus, he discovers he had a brother named Martin who ended up dying because he refused to walk away. It's at this point that the penny starts to drop and Marty realizes he has to be more careful. Out with Brown and Clara, she says, Uh huh. That one's called Copernicus. With that being the name of a scientist that the doc would name his dog after. He then starts alluding to the future and talks about how much the world will change in the next hundred years. She wonders if man will ever step foot on the moon or if they'll hit the thumbs up button, and in the end, he starts quoting Vern. Shooting stars fly, and back at docks, we see his machine set up to make a cooked breakfast. This is, of course, similar to the first film, in which he had something set up to give Einstein his food. These gadgets and gizmos took inspiration from Caractus Pot, who was a crazy inventor and chitty chitty bang bang. This character ended up inspiring Doc's luck, and Marty in the scene also takes from a famous movie. That is Taxi Driver, with him riffing off the mirror scene in that as he practices for Tannen. Later on, he of course also wears similar clothes to Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name, which at the end his brother even points out. Norm. Hey Marty, who are you supposed to be, Clint Eastwood? <laughs> Spotting the gravestone, we see that Doc's name's gone in the photo, implying that it could be Marty instead. Great Scott! I know, this is heavy. Now that, that's one of my favourite lines in the franchise, as the two characters have finally swapped catchphrases. Such a good little line, and I also love how Doc's hat has the bullet hole in it from where he was shot the night before. Alluding to what happens to Marty in the future, this builds off the back of what Doc touched upon in part 2. This kind of speaks to the themes of the film, and when thinking about it, it's an opposite to George. 
You see George in the first film, he was pretty much a doormat that let everyone treat him exactly how they wanted. In the end, he had to stand up for himself, which is something that Marty had no problem doing. However, with Marty it means stuff goes from 0 to 100 or 0 to 88 and this in the end leads to him injured in a crash. This means that he can't play guitar properly and becomes an old man trying to strum away desperately. What? George had to become ready to fight when necessary, whereas Marty has to learn when he needs to walk away. Overall, they become way more balanced and thoughtful characters that do what's right when it's needed, but not to their own detriment. Marty then convinces Doc to break things off because he says that he's a scientist. He wants him to use his brain and not stay in the past, and in some ways it reflects Marty in part two. I caution you about disrupting the continuum for your own personal benefit, therefore I must do no less. This is in the same way that Marty stole the almanac and he'd be messing with time to get what he wants. Personally though, I think leaving Clara in the past, that's going to cause more issues mate. So it might be time to go out and, you know, old yeller her. I don't know, maybe we can just take Clara with us. Oh yeah, yeah, you take her to the future. Now they then roll the car off and Marty says, Wow, that worked great. This is actually a little known to the production crew who were worried that a DeLorean wouldn't fit the track. However, luckily for them, they realised when putting it together that the car actually had the exact measurements required to roll on the railway. Thus, no changes to the car were really needed to be made, and they could just plonk it on the tracks and then keep on moving. Job's done, let's finish early. This is the way. Now, after getting slapped by Clara for telling the truth, we then see his doc goes out to drown his sorrows. The explanation he gives here is also worded very similar to how Marty tells Doc that he's from the future in the first one. I'm from the future. I'm from the future. I came here in a time machine that I invented. I came here in a time machine that you invented. And tomorrow I have to go back to the year 1985. Now I need your help to get back to the year 1985. Guy stands at the bar with one shot, one shot. Wait, is that is that Doc from The Thing? That's, bl that's bloody Doc from The Thing. You son of a bitch. As he chats with Doc, you can see him holding barbed wire, which might make you think, what what the heckins is going on? Well, this figure is actually John Wayne Gates, who worked as a salesman for the Southern Wire Company. As electricity and wires became more commonplace, the man in the company ended up making a fortune, with his skates were then go on to found the Texas Oil Company, which years later got renamed to Texaco. Texaco is something that appeared in the first two films, and I love how they managed to get its origins in here. Waking up Marty then rushes into town and this is so he can grab Doc and the pair can escape. We catch him still holding on to the one shot and can tell by the bottle that he's not drank anything. Now according to IMDb Trivia, this is a nod to support your local gunfighter in which Doc Schultz's character ended up drinking way too much. After taking every shot of whiskey then passed out which is when the bartender knocked up some wake up juice. Doc Schultz was played by Dub Taylor who again's in that group of the three old timers. This wake up juice ingredients includes Tabasco sauce with a label being the version used in the 1880s. I genuinely always used to wonder whether, whether something like this would work and let me know below if you've ever had a crazy hangover cure uh, that's along the lines of this. Now he's lured out by Buford calling him a chicken and I love how Marty says it's not 8 o'clock yet. It's not 8 o'clock yet! It is by my watch! And we can obviously see by the clock in the same moment that the time the time's still 5 to make up 5 minutes. Now another issue that's with this duel is that the creative team realised Marty couldn't kill Buford. If he did then Biff would never be born and then we'd have both Doc and Marty wiped out as well. So what they did is that they realised Marty shouldn't kill him and instead he was just going to fight him with his brain and fists. Thus he confronts him and we get some classic western iconography such as the fingers dangling above the gun. Dropping his and taking the shot, Marty then reveals the bulletproof vest. Vests like this have shown up before and it's how Doc managed to survive the terrorists in part 1. If you listen really really closely you can also hear the bullet hitting the metal which was put in by the sound designers. This is also the second time he's tricked a tannin by faking his own death as he jumped off Biff's casino during part 2. He then beats Buford up, cracks the grave and then dumps him in manure. I hate my the kid then gives him his gun back, which the wiki states was supposed to have some other lines. Apparently in the novelization, the kid asks where Marty learned to do that, and he then says that he saw it in a movie. The boy's mother then calls out his name, which we learn is David Walk Griffith. This filmmaking pioneer was born in 1875, and he'd gone to make movies, which is why they said it here. 
Now from here we then see as they race to catch the train, but the bad news is Clara has already gotten off. Holding it up, we then get what's a pretty cool easter egg that I did mention in our part 2 video, but in case you didn't see that, then here, here's what it is. But Doc Brown's bandana is actually made from the shirt that we could see him wearing throughout part 2. This shirt had a train and two horsemen chasing after it, foreshadowing what was going to happen in this scene. These railway scenes are also shot on the Sierra Railroad, which was used in the Western High Noon. We can also see that the locomotive number is 131, but, but mate, according to the trivia, yeah, these weren't made available until 1891. I'm bloody furious, it's the worst movie ever! Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Anyway, they start heading to the ravine, with Doc blowing the train whistle and saying, Zemeckis would later reference this in Polar Express when the train whistle was blown there too. I've wanted to do that my whole life. Clara tries to climb on board, shit hits the fan, and using the hoverboard, Doc manages to save her. We then see as the pair skate away, and Marty finally gets to go home. The train bit used for this was actually a model, with it then going over the edge into the ravine. Back in the future, or past for us, the car gets destroyed by a train, and that finally puts an end to the DeLorean. According to IMDb Trivia, the, the driver of the diesel train, they, they, they said to him, look, you're going to smash through the car, it might be dangerous, are, are you sure you still want to do it? He turned around and said, and to quote Doc Brown, I wanted to do that all my life! Trains driving into cars can obviously be very traumatic for the driver if someone's inside, but I, I can imagine you you would want to, you'd have that itch that wanted to be scratched where you just plow into a car, not with people in, but you know what I mean, uh, but it's very rare that drivers would actually get to do this. So him getting to do this was a dream come true, and I love seeing it getting smashed like the like button. Doc wanting to destroy it is something he's said in every film, and that also being what started off the whole western setup that they established in part 2. It's destroyed. Like Returning to Line Estate, Marty makes it home where we catch his truck in the garage. Biff says he's about to put on a second coat, which is a reference to these lines in the franchise. Hey Gramps! I told you two coats of wax on my car, not just one! Uh, now Biff, I want to make sure that we get two coats of wax this time, not just one. Dear Biff, Forty! I, I didn't mean to scare you, I, I didn't recognize you in those clothes. What the I, hell are you doing? Uh, just putting on the second coat now. <laughs> Still ain't bloody done it, eh? I should knock you the fuck out for what you've caused, mate. Did you realise the shitstorm you've caused? I'm travelling across to Jennifer, we see it's all fine and dandy, and then it, it was absolutely okay leaving her in the crime-ridden 1985. Yep, just leave a young, attractive woman on the porch when people are driving by shooting at houses, and just go back in time, mate. It's gonna be fine. Now, a little bit of trivia. This was the only scene shot during part two that appeared as a new one for this movie. From here they travel out to Helldale and we can see the sign for it says the address for success with it saying the address for suckers in the alternate timeline. Needle Zen pulls up playing the power of love and he says hey! The Big M Hey the Big M How's it hanging McFly? How's it hanging McFly? Hey Needles Hey Needles What's the matter? Chicken? Unless you want everyone in Division to think you're chicken. Marty also tried to play the power of love on his guitar back in part 2 after being fired because of Needles ruining his life again. Calling him chicken, we see as Marty ends up reversing, which we get a clue by from how he moves the gear stick. Marty clearly puts it in reverse, and thus he ends up missing the silver Rolls Royce. The your fired fax text then disappears, and we go out onto the train tracks. Now, I don't get how the train signal knows the train's coming from the past, but it, it does somehow, and yeah, we see his Doc returns. The train's rocking his initials, the ELB, which, as we said earlier, were left on the wood covering the DeLorean. Also, I love how the doors open up like the DeLorean, and hey, if you want to time travel, you might as well do it in style. We also see their sons, Jules and Vern, and hey, good gonna point something out that was brought up on a podcast years ago i can't remember which one i think it was kind of funny but since then i've never not noticed it now as doc says the future hasn't been written yet we can see one of the kids doing a weird gesture with his hand and then pointing at his pants apparently right apparently the kid was was desperate for a wee and what he was doing he was signaling to his mum behind the camera that he needed to go don't know why don't know why they left it in the movie but hey I hope you never work again. I hope you never work again, kid, because you ruined the movie. 
You scumbag. Anyway, but in the call back to the end of part one, we see as a train takes off just like the DeLorean and then flies directly to the screen. Instead of getting a message teasing more to come, we finally get some text pop up saying the end. However, though there's been lots of talk that they'd never make a sequel, I dug deep and found out there were plans for part four. This would see Doc and the family going to Roswell to witness an alien crash in 1947. Marty was going to be absent from most of the script, but he would appear in a cameo role at some point. However, as we know, that never came to be, and both Gail and Zemeckis have both said they'll never allow sequels to be made. As long as they're alive, at least, which I'm guessing some Hollywood executives being like, challenge accepted. However, we did get an animated series which ended up running for two seasons, and also had a parody trailer for part four, which starred both Fox and Lloyd. Personally, I hope we don't get a sequel or reboot, and I think some things are just best left alone. Let me know below what you think, and I'd love to hear what you guys would do if you could go back in time. Personally, I'd go back to my part 2 video, and I'd change it so that I said the Jaws boxes in the windows were LGN games and not VHS. And maybe, maybe if I concentrate, I, ca I can do that, maybe. <laughs> And here we can see the Jaws 1 and 2 game boxes by LJN. We did it! We changed the timeline and now we can rest. So what's next? Well, we will be working on Dune, Blade 2, Wicker Man and Terminator 3 Breakdowns very soon before shifting over to A Clockwork Orange. I need to stop promising Terminator 3, but I, w I will get to it, I promise. There's just so many movies I'm watching that I'm like, this would be a great breakdown, this would be a great breakdown. And Terminator 3, I'm like... <sighs> don't, don't know if I want to do that, but it is a promise, even though I need to stop promising. And, and either way, thank you for joining me in this journey. And if you want to support the channel and get to listen and watch these breakdowns early, then please hit the join button. For 99 pence and 99 cents a month, you'll get early access and it makes a massive difference to the channel. By the way, thank you for sitting with us. I've been Paul, you've been the best, and this has been Heavy. There's that word again, heavy. Why are things so heavy in the future? Is there a problem with the Earth's gravitational pull?